Welcome everyone. My name is Amalia Almada and on behalf of the USC Sea Grant team, we're thrilled to spend this afternoon with you and our panelists to take a thoughtful look at how to best bring research to have meaningful impact on water quality and coastal resilience challenges in Southern California. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples who for millennia have lived, thrived, and stewarded the land and waters in this region, where all of this great research we'll hear about today took place. We pay our respects to the Gabrielino Tongva, as well as the neighboring tribes, the Chumash, Catavium, Serrano, Kawia, Luiseño, Achuman, and Kumi nations, who still have deep kinship to their traditional homelands and all life therein. Today, we'll hear from researchers who were recently funded through the Ocean Protection Council Prop 84, as well as through USC Sea Grant research calls. We'll hear how their work has been or will be used to address management needs in California. And from these discussions with the researchers and our audience, our big picture goal is to begin to outline best practices and the research to application process for urban ocean issues in Southern California. Regarding our format for today, we'll start with welcome remarks from the Ocean Protection Council, as well as from the USC Sea Grant Director. And then we will launch into our three panels with the first focus on advancing water quality science from watersheds to coastlines. Our second panel will focus on building coastal resilience. And the third is a synthesis around building best practices for bringing research to application. We will have a healthy chunk of time for Q&A with our panelists. And with that, I'll turn it over to Caitlin Kalua, Deputy Director of the California Ocean Protection Council. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Amalia, and just welcome everyone. Just wanna start by saying, you know, what a privilege is to be here to welcome everyone. Originally was slated to welcome you in person in the California Natural Resources Building in Sacramento, but also equally thrilled to join everyone virtually today. Uh, for those who are maybe less familiar and by way of background, uh, just a brief statement that the Ocean Protection Council is a cabinet level state policy body with the Natural Resources Agency for California, uh, whose mission is to ensure a healthy coastal and ocean ecosystems. This includes advancing innovative science-based policy and management, as well as making strategic investments to pursue those goals. Um, related to today's theme of research to application, OPC's uh, key function is to fill critical data and information needs across various state agencies and to help our state and local agencies make informed decisions with the best available science. Uh, with that, uh, central to our work is partnership with institutions such as C USC Sea Grant. Um, just again, thank you to the USC Sea Grant team today. It's just a wonderful ongoing partnership and opportunity to ground academic research and support our local de decision-making through this research and ensuring that the research that is funded through these opportunities is not only building scientific um, progress or processes, but it provides a building block to inform state and local action. So again, it's that research to application. We were very unfortunate to partner with the OCC grant um, in the administration of the Prop 84 competitive grant funds and I'm thrilled for the number of projects we're gonna hear from today that are funded through that program. Um, again, can't emphasize enough that we're so grateful for the ongoing partnership with the OCC grant and look forward to today's panel discussions. With that, I'm pleased to pass to Dr. Carla Heidelberg. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Caitlin, for your remarks and for OPDC's partnership in funding several of the projects that you'll hear um, about today. This half-day workshop, which has been funded by the National Sea Grant Office, is designed to bring together members of the California research community, NGOs, local, state, federal agency leads, um, and all of these groups to consider new scientific information from USC Sea Grant funded research, discuss how that information can be used for management needs and identify best practices to improve future research to application processes for Southern California's urban ocean challenges. I don't need to tell anyone in this workshop that research to application is really hard. It's often overlooked as kind of an essential part of the scientific process as described in a, in a 2021 
um, Frontiers of Marine Science paper by Jones et al. Um, for example, some of the points that they made were that researchers often use highly technical language that may be hard to summarize and effectively communicate to others. The research findings are often not directly applicable or relevant to real world situations. There's often limited resources which hinder the implementation of wide ranging research findings into practice. Um, existing policies and regulations may not align with the research recommendations, creating barriers to implementation. And then a couple more points, um, you know, not having standardized methods for translating the research findings into practice can lead to inconsistency and lack of standardized evaluations and monitoring mechanisms may hinder the assessment of the impact um, of research and practice. So, successful translation of research into practice requires a collaborative and iterative approach involving ongoing communication, adaptation, and commitment to addressing challenges as they arise. Sea Grant is uniquely tasked and positioned to fund more applied or targeted science that meets the changing needs of decision makers. In addition to funding science, Sea Grant can then also serve as a catalyst for the translation of the scientific knowledge into actionable measures by also providing extension services, technical assistance, education outreach, collaboration, all of these things, um, and reaching a really wide community of stakeholders. USC Sea Grant just celebrated its 50th anniversary. Over the decades, we've been successful at being a leader in addressing key coastal challenges, especially with respect to issues related to the urban ocean and solving issues arising out of managing people and natural resources in a, a really intensely urban and developed coastline. The issues that arise from changing urban oceans have evolved over time. We now face challenges with warming and rising waters, intensive development of coastlines, challenges with water quality, and growing competition for uses of ocean space. Our research investment has tracked these emergent challenges with a strong focus on ensuring that research dollars translate to implementation of gained knowledge. Our Sea Grant program and Sea Grant programs across the nation promote better communication by fostering partnerships and collaborations between the scientists, the policymakers, industry stakeholders, and communities. This collaborative approach helps to ensure that research findings are relevant and applicable to the needs of the various stakeholders. But as mentioned before, this translation of research is not always easy to do. And our goal is that this workshop is the start of a series of more formal conversations to bring together Californian research community with decision makers at all levels, along with other stakeholders from non-governmental organizations and educators to consider how the findings from our funded investments can be used for management needs. We also want this workshop to help us develop best practices for better communication strategies for dissemination of, and education. Our goal is that the outcomes from this effort today will be shared with future Sea Grant researchers as well as the broader Sea Grant network. Today, we're going to hear about some exciting research findings and perspectives from several of our past funded water quality and coastal resilience researchers studying urban ocean challenges. These presenters model how their research has been designed and framed to be brought to the real world. Um, of note, I have to admit that I've known a couple of the speakers since they were in graduate school, and it's so rewarding for me to see, now see them as experts in very successful and relevant careers that are embracing a research to application strategy. In the first two panels, we'll look forward to hearing what these and other speakers describe as best practices for researchers walking the path to implementation. Then finally, We'll close this workshop with a panel comprised of representatives from some of our key agency partners to hear their perspective on what they see as critical steps for research to application as we look to future management practices and challenges for Southern California waters. 
So at this point, I'd like to turn this back over to Caitlin, the Deputy Director of OPC, who will serve as the moderator of our first panel on water quality science. Welcome to everyone. And let me, I forgot, I, this is the most important thing. I want to thank my team at Sea Grant. They are an amazing group of people who work very hard and bring diverse perspectives to everything that we try to do. So with that, Caitlin, it's all yours. Wonderful, thank you, Carla. All right, happy to kick off today. Uh, by way of background, um, within OPC, as previously the Water Quality Program Manager, so this panel is near and dear um, to my professional heart in that capacity, but just uh, grateful for the panelists joining us today, Dr. Jamie Smith, uh, Professor Jennifer Jay, Professor uh, Karen Shapiro, and Dr. Holly Bowers to provide this uh, panel overview of the latest, their latest work on advancing water quality science from watersheds to coastlines and really diving into those uh, dynamic challenges between our urban interface and our coastal and ocean environments, as well as what are the compounding challenges in either detecting um, new emerging contaminants, it would be microplastics or the impacts of, of contaminants um, in natural complex systems. So with that, I'm happy to pass off to our first panelist, Dr. Jamie Smith. All right, hi, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, everything looks good? All right. Um, so I am thankful for that uh, introduction, Caitlin, thank you. Uh, and I wanted to give a shout out to a couple other folks that participated on this project, because as Carla mentioned, I'm one of those folks that she knew since graduate school. I worked on this project as a graduate student, um, and I'm now a senior scientist at, at Squirp. Um, so the folks that that um, really did a lot of this more historical work is Dave Karen, Avery Tatters, Eric Webb and Meredith Howard. So I, this, this wouldn't be possible without them. Uh, so I wanted to take a big step back from the specific project that I'm going to talk about in a second and just, you know, state that many of you are aware and probably, you know, in this past summer saw in the news that the Southern California faces a lot of different harmful algal bloom issues. I think the most well known is those that we face in our coastal system and USC Sea Grant has plugged in to deal with those issues a lot over the last 15, 20 years. Um, I'm showing a picture here on the right of, of a recent, the marine mammal stranding event from this summer. These are just a couple of the over 1,000 marine mammals that stranded this summer due to intoxication from a demonic acid producing harmful algal bloom. But equally on the inland side, which I know is a little bit, you know, at first sounds like it's out of the scope of USCC grant, um, is there, there's equal issues in inland waters with harmful algal blooms. And so I want to just kind of show you how USC Sea Grant uh, in collaboration with kind of other, other entities have plugged in to kind of advance our understanding of these issues in Southern California. So I think, you know, the biggest question that kind of comes up with managers in particular is why are these blooms happening? Um, how can we stop them? How can we predict them, right? And so the biggest, the biggest step we can take as researchers, I think, um, right off the bat is to try to help build that understanding of why blooms happen. And so I'm showing just a figure from that represents really a, at this point, 20 year time series of observations of coastal harmful algal blooms that there's been multiple USCC grant projects that have plugged into along with kind of NOAA EcoHub and MERHAB programs that have built this really robust uh, data set that goes back to the early 2000s of harmful algal blooms that's really helped us as a research community put some, you know, some uh, answers to that question of what is causing these blooms. So for example, here, I'm just showing one of the key findings of all of that work is that upwelling seems to be one of the major drivers of demoic acid bloom events. And so we can take this type of understanding, uh, like we show in this figure, this time series of of an upwelling event, and then we are able to capture some doom, bloom development, and then kind of ultimately toxin present in the environment, and plug that into things like predictive and mechanistic models that help us move towards managing these events. So in addition to understanding why bloom events happen, in, in harmful algal bloom science, a really important thing is just being able to measure um, and monitor harmful algal blooms for the protection of public and, and wildlife health. 
So methodology development and implementation is another really important piece of this puzzle. And so I wanted to highlight one piece of technology um, called solid phase adsorption toxin tracking or SPAT for short. Um, as a piece of a piece of technology where there's been multiple USCC grant awards um, that have kind of helped take this as you know a really kind of researchy tool and actually get it into the hands of managers. Um, this is a really neat tool because it's a a very small uh, you know you can fit in the palm of your hand, uh, size of a tea bag at some in some cases, integrated passive sampler that has the ability to adsorb both freshwater and marine harmful algal bloom toxins um, with no electricity or anything like that. Very low tech, but you can get a lot of information about it, um, about um, bloom dynamics and the presence um, of toxins and problem characterization. And so I'm gonna just highlight here where this is a management integration uh, kind of of this tool has been really successful and in particular, uh, this tool, although it 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 was uh, originally formed and used in marine waters, is actually very commonly used in inland waters now by a lot of uh, state water board uh, folks for measuring inland harmful algal bloom toxins. And then I'm going to show you how we've used that kind of more in coastal systems in a couple of slides, but um, very kind of successful Method, methodology development and then putting it into the hands of managers where they now use it on a routine basis in many systems throughout California. Oops, nice slide here. And then lastly, kind of the identification of emerging HAB issues. So that's really what the crux of the project that I was asked to talk to, uh, talk to you all about today is about, um, is that, you know, there was this big event in 2010 in Monterey Bay where inland hab toxins were flushed down into the elk horse orange slough, they got into the marine food web, and there was a mass mortality event of the endangered California sea otter. And so there were additional studies that were then done throughout Monterey Bay to kind of understand, was this kind of a one-off phenomenon, or is this something that seems to happen all the time? And so using SPAT samplers, uh, there was uh, Corey Gibble and Rafe Cadella out of UC Santa Cruz, did a study on all of these kind of land, land sea interface zones where, where rivers meet the ocean and found that microsystems were really prevalent in that coastal zone. And so that led to the impetus for the, the project that we worked on, which was, is this just a Monterey Bay thing or is this kind of a larger, more widespread phenomenon? And so we asked the question, are freshwater toxin producers and their corresponding toxins also present in the coastal zone within Southern California? And so the crux of the large uh, component of the work that was done under the um, the Tiny and Toxic project um, that I worked on at, while I was at USC was to do kind of a regional study to ask that question within um, the Southern California Bite region. And so what we did was a region-wide survey of 53 locations. Um, where we looked for the presence of the cyanobacteria, so the potential for the toxin production uh, as, as evidenced by the critters that make the toxin as well as the presence of the toxin. And so I've just thrown that map up from that resulting publication here. And what we found was, yes, there's widespread presence of toxin producing cyanobacteria kind of in these land sea interface zones, much more than we initially thought it was something that people didn't really look at before that sea otter event. Um, and there were toxins present at 60% of these sites. So not only was the toxin producer there, but many of them were actually producing the toxin. And so we have we started really early on integrating management into this issue. And so we collaborated directly with the San Diego, San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board to conduct this field study and we actually engaged them in the research activities, they, they helped us do some of the field work. And so that was some of the leveraging that we did with the USCC grant project is, is we put you know, the tools in their hand and they helped us do the field sampling, they're co-authors on this paper. And so that then we were able to leverage that work into an even larger kind of statewide study, again, using our, our SPAT tool that we had developed um, or worked on previously, and looking at this then, right, if we see this in Monterey Bay, if we see it in Southern California Bight, 
is this really kind of a statewide issue? And so I'm just showing you kind of a, a the key graphics from a uh, Merhab project that was that that USCC grant helped kind of build the get create the seed data to kind of make the proposal um, for a larger NOAA uh, Merhab award to do a year long study at multiple sites. Uh, statewide. And so what I'm showing is this the spat results. And so the colors are basically the number of toxins that we're seeing off of the spat bags. Um, we came, so we we looked for kind of the common marine toxins that you would expect to see within the marine zone, but also a number of cyanotoxins that would have an inland water source. So the more warm the color is, the more number of toxins they have, the cooler, the less number of toxins. And then the size of, of the circle is the concentration. And so what you can kind of take away is that there's a lot of places, there's some places that have many toxins present. So Santa Cruz Wharf, for example, maybe lower concentrations. There's other places within like the Klamath Estuary, for example, less toxins, but frankly, pretty microcystin uh, dominated. And um, sometimes very high concentration, same thing for places like Santa Clara River Estuary. Um, so those are some of our high level findings. And I think then uh, I'd wanna spotlight here as well that we we worked with a couple of tribal nations and um, water board staff to do this sampling as well. So kind of early and often engaging with management. So how does this all link to management? And I think our, our, our sign of success of this work is there was the recently um, implemented state uh, inland HABs monitoring program. As a part of that, they built their, their strategy document, which is essentially their decadal vision for what they're gonna do as a program uh, that, that was just implemented. And so in this document, I wanted to highlight that um, the, the FHAB state uh, program has, has named their specific environments that they want to consider. When this was first, when we were in first talks of, of doing this, uh, I helped them with co-authoring this. There, they had two water body types, two priority water body types. It was lakes and reservoirs and streams and rivers. By engaging them in this research process and showing them kind of the, the fact that the, the toxins from inland waters are actually moving into estuaries and the coastal zone, they then added coastal confluences as a third priority area for their monitoring program. So that's their term for the estuaries, coastal lagoons and whatnot that are influenced by inland river, river uh, runoff. Uh, so basically those sites that we were working on studying. And so I think that's a, that's a really good signal of success that we've brought this to management concern and they've now kind of integrated that into their strategic plan for the next decade of how they're going to monitor these systems for not only marine harmful algal toxins, but also um, cyanobacterial toxins from inland waters. So with that, I know we're short on time and that we'll get to do questions um, at the panel, but uh, I look forward to, to answering any questions on this work. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, just to reiterate that um, as, as presentations are taking place this afternoon, please do share any questions you have uh, through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please do indicate who you're directing your question to, or if it's for the entire panel, please just say full panel question. Um, so again, thank you, Jamie, and we'll, we'll continue. Um, with that, moving to Professor Jennifer Jay of the University of uh, California, Los Angeles, who's speaking on the ocean is an important source of transmission of antibiotic resistant bacteria to humans. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for this invitation. Very, very excited to be here to talk about uh, what my students and I have been up to. Um, we are, have a lot of different projects to show us. So I just wanted to start with thanking the students who just work so, so hard and are so passionate about the ocean and the environment in general. It's very, very inspiring. Um, this slide focuses on our undergrads. Um, we work a lot with, with um, introducing undergrads to many, mostly their first research experiences. Um, and the, the reason why we do that is because research has just so many benefits for undergrads. I have a slide 
uh, here we go, talking about all of these benefits. Um, but, so what we've been doing is actually taking a very inclusive approach and making many opportunities that students can just sign up for, just enroll in. So this idea is called course-based research experience. Um, it's different from a lab class because they're doing kind of authentic research where they're um, that's of general interest to the scientific community. So they're part of real projects. And um, yeah, it's just been really fulfilling because otherwise students kind of have to be connected or they have to fight to kind of get into a research lab. But we've been doing a lot of different projects that offer units or are part of a, a typically lecture-based class. So I'll highlight those opportunities as we go. Um, I did want to start off with our surfer project. This is one that did take an awful lot of um, of assistance to to pull off. Um, it was really orchestrated by PhD student Megan Rue, um, now has her doctorate, former PhD student. Um, but we basically were very interested in how antibiotic resistant bacteria in the environment may impact humans. And in general, we were interested in, in that question. And this idea to use surfers was actually really um, brilliant idea of Megan's because the surfers start off in the dry season when the water's relatively more clean and then there's the wet season and so you can kind of watch what happens to the people and um, in this case surfers often do surf in impaired water we didn't tell them to do that but they were doing it anyway and so we monitored their nasal cavities um, for um, bacterial colonization. And at the same time, we measured what was going on in the water. Um, we had a presence at two beaches, El Porto and Venice. And it was just a lot of early mornings out there at the beach taking water samples and then uh, sometimes literally running alongside the surfers as they were on their way to the ocean, um, doing recruitment, letting them know about the study. Um, and then hopefully they would agree to be swabbed repeatedly. That was the design of the study. Um, mostly we, we had quite a few repeats, some, some one-offs, um, but we also studied what was going on in the water. So these are the bacteria that were growing on a medium that's selected for MRSA. So we actually designed the study to be a MRSA study. So we're using this chrome agar MRSA agar. It turns out it's not very selective. So it became a broader antibiotic resistant bacteria study. Um, but you can see the red and green lines showing um, the biggest level, the largest levels are coming with the first rain. And this is just one year of data, but that same, same pattern happened. It really came in the first flush. Um, and this goes along with our qPCR resistance gene um, results as well that showed that the flush was the largest time. And then this is um, this graph is showing the percent positive nasal swabs. And you can see El Porto in blue, Venice Beach in red, and our non-surfing controls in yellow. And this was the before. This was in October and early November before the big rains came. And then we do, we had saw one of the years we saw an, an increase in the control group as well. One year we didn't, but basically we saw a very hefty increase in the surfer nasal cavities, especially um, at El Porto. And so what, so we can see a lot is coming off the watersheds during that big first flush. So this next study is a, a specific look at the LA River. And this was led by PhD student Ileana Callejas. Uh, and she was interested in how ARGs, that's antibiotic resistance genes, and other bacteria um, vary as you go from these tributaries up in the headwaters. So that we really went totally along an urbanization gradient from up um, in the headwaters all the way down through to the ocean. And these are some pictures we got to. So basically you have to hike to these water um, sample points and there that's Switzer Falls, which highly recommended hike. Um, and then we were able to catch above and, and below some uh, water reclamation plants inputs to the LA River. And so the key part of this study was really about the methods because antibiotic resistance doesn't have standardized methods yet. So it's not really on the regulatory radar screen yet. And the methods aren't 
decided upon, basically. And further, there are very, very wide range of methods that you can use to characterize antibiotic resistance. And there's different camps. So there's different people who do this different ways. So you, you have your culture-based approaches, and those are advantageous in a way because you know you have a live cell and you can tell that a particular bacterium, you can test it for resistance to a particular antibiotic. So that's culture-based. And then we have DNA-based techniques that would include quantitative PCR. We're really drilling down on a particular genes that you're interested in. And we also have metagenomic sequencing, which a lot of people say is the wave of the future. It's There's so much information you can get from whole genome sequencing. Uh, but all of these methods have their pros and cons. Metagenomic sequencing is obviously much more expensive. The price is coming down, but it's very costly. It's around $400 per sample. Um, and and uh, culture-based would be the cheapest, but maybe more labor-intensive. So where, where we felt our lab could help and is by cross-validation, which is a big research need right now. We have all this different all these different papers for the last couple of decades on resistance in the environment, but done by all different methods. So it's really valuable to have the same samples tested by a variety of methods so we can help understand or help elucidate how these methods relate to one another. So within our culture base, we also, we picked a particular screen screening organism uh, or screening method for this um, extended spectrum beta-lactamase E. coli. So this is a particular type of bacterium and a particular group of antibiotics resistance to. Um, and so we were testing a very simple screening method for that. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, this is just our E. coli. And we showed that, yes, during the, this is the headwaters to the left. And then you get uh, much higher levels as you go down to the urbanized portion. And the water reclamation plants dilute the E. coli since they put, these are um, uh, live cells we're measuring and the water is disinfected. So we see diluting of E. coli at the water reclamation plants. But then these are our resistance genes. This is just one of them that tends to indicate the others, but it's, um, it's int I1 it's called, and it's basically very low in the headwaters. And this one does increase because DNA is present even in when the um, bacteria have been killed. Um, so this is a really exciting graph for us because um, on one page, you can see culture base, which is way over to the right, qPCR and metagenomic techniques. And so these go from the top, the top of each graph is the headwaters. And then you can go down through the stem and say for the qPCR, you can see where certain resistance genes really light up. Um, compared to the headwaters, they all get somewhat more prevalent through the stem. Okay, so that um, is a fair amount of lab work um, and it tells a certain story. The metagenomic, so each, each row here is a metagenomic sample. So this one's very, very expensive, but you can see, and there is a lot of information here. These are different antibiotic classes. There's much, much more information that you can um, drill down into if you know you're interested in that particular site. But what you can see over to the right is the simple screening tool. So we got really excited because it's like $10 per sample instead of $400 per sample. And mostly it picks up where you might want to then use a tiered approach and drill down in. Um, so we got pretty excited about this method. So I wanted to share our next project, which is um, really validating this screening tool for this bacterium. Um, there was a paper by Hornsby that came out. We were kind of working concurrently on the same exact um, project. And so it's great. They already published it in freshwater and we're looking in marine systems. Um, this idea where you can use it, this kit-based approach um, if um, where IDEX is the manufacturer, but it's an easy way to measure E. coli. And all you have to do is just add antibiotics to this kit-based approach. So this is the screening tool. It's very simple. We actually took it in, um, to Belize. We took it on an airplane, you know, so you, it's, it has global monitoring potential as well. Um, 
but there is a gold standard way to get at ESBL E. coli. So this is method is not really yet validated except by that one paper in freshwater. Um, so we did concurrently this method by the kit based, the easy approach, as well as the very laborious plate based methods. And so um, the advantage is that it's much, much cheaper and easier. And so we, we had to go to Tijuana to get a full calibration curve or the US-Mexico border where we got higher levels, unfortunately, due to the inputs into the water there. But I just wanted to quickly show this was our field site. And um, we had several different, we had a, um, the YMCA and beaches, the Imperial Beach Pier, and then spots along this sandy area near the estuary. But um, and so we we basically compared the traditional, very labor intensive plate method with the modified kit method. And you can see really promising results. So this is very, very exciting. It, um, and in order to appreciate, you have to understand how much work goes into those plate-based methods. It's so much work. Um, and we're able to um, really show that the kit-based method was able to reproduce it. So. Um, so that is exciting. And then um, another project I want to tell you about, we've been up to doing a lot of matchup days for to understand how we can better use all the satellite data that is uh, constantly being brought in by satellites and is mostly freely available. And there's some you have to pay for, but there's a lot of freely available data coming in on the coastal ocean. And we want to help under, um, elucidate you know, how we can use it better. And so we've been basically taking concurrent ground-based measurements on satellite overpass days with students who find this very exciting to go out to the beach when the satellite is passing over and they have a very short window. You collect as many water samples as possible. Um, and then you also collect the images. So there's the true color image on the left. And then um, but if you drew, so that looks like just the ocean looks like a big dark mass. But if you dig down into all the different bands that are reported in the satellite data, there's so much information tucked into all of those bands. There's different algorithms you can use that would be um, combinations of different bands and you can get um, algorithms will give you estimates of turbidity and you can, so this has been shown many times before, turbidity on the ground can match pretty well with turbidity from the satellite. Fewer labs have me measured E. coli. So that's what, that's our contribution is adding in some beginning understanding of how E. coli relates. In this case, we got a good relationship with suspended particulate matter. Um, and so um, we've been doing this. So Adrian Jones at, at Mount St. Mary's is also a PI on this grant. And so has been involved in all of this work um, and including a collaborative educational project we did where we had students out there and we assessed their learning. So I know this is a lot on the slide, but we basically have an education paper just showing um, how they tend to improve on all of these different questions and whether they're first gen or whether they're not or female or male, we're digging down into how they're impacted by these research experiences. And I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Jenny. I was just getting ready to ring the one minute warning. So that was perfect. <laughs> 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 really fascinating. Thank you. Um, again, we'll hold all questions for we have 15 minutes uh, set aside following each panel presentation that we'll get to do any follow up. Um, so please do share any questions in the chat or hold until the end of the panel presentations. With that, I'll turn to uh, Professor Karen Shapiro with the University of California Davis on the interaction between microplastics and pathogen pollutants in marine ecosystems, as well as implications for seafood safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody can see my slides and hear me okay? All right. Um, so good afternoon. It's great to be with this group here today. I'm very excited to share some of our work on microplastics. So a little bit of background on what the study was all about. I think all of us here are quite familiar with the issue of plastic waste and the fact that it has been documented to be pervasive marine pollutant globally. 
So in terms of understanding the impact of plastic on uh, wildlife and humans, it's often a lot easier to understand this in the context of big plastic waste. So I think all of us have seen headlines and images in National Geographic of wildlife that become entangled in uh, fishing gear, for example, or nets. And that certainly is an important impact of plastic waste. But there is also a more invisible uh, problem that has become quite um, uh, important in terms of its distribution and also a lot of media attention, and that's microplastics. So microplastics, by definition, are plastic particles that are smaller than five millimeters. And these can be produced as uh, just degradation products of, or, or as plastic gets weathered in the ocean, it starts falling apart into, into these small particles. And there's also a lot of microplastics that are just produced in industry that make their way to the ocean. And these tiny plastic particles have been found globally, both in species that we eat as seafood and also in prey for wildlife. That said, there is still a lack of understanding on why that is bad for us or why that could be detrimental to the health of wildlife. So an area of research that my lab has become particularly interested in is trying to understand whether there's a potential interaction between plastics and pathogens. And that could be important in trying to understand whether plastic pollution can affect pathogen transmission. So why do we think that this can happen? So about two or three years before we submitted our Sea Grant proposal, there was a paper that came out documenting the presence of Vibrio, which is a bacteria that thrives in marine ecosystems. Vibrio has been found in these uh, biofilms that code plastics. In just a couple of years earlier, my group published on zoonotic protozoan pathogens, and I'll explain what those are in a second, how these pathogens can become trapped in natural biofilms. So biofilms that naturally occur in the marine environment. And for example, here we have a toxoplasma oocyst, and I'll talk about toxoplasma and what it is. And this is just uh, an organic particle. Has, this is not plastic. And all of this blue color is biofilm. And we suspect that biofilms are very important for pathogen transmission in the ocean in general. And so by extension, we became very interested in the question of, can this also happen in biofilms that coat plastics? So there's a few pathogens that my group focuses on, and I, I can't go through a talk on parasites without life cycles. I promise this will only take a minute, but it is important to understand. Um, there's three parasites we're gonna talk about today, and one of them is Toxoplasma gondii, Toxoplasma for short. And this parasite um, is produced by cats. So this includes both wild cats and domestic cats. After their first infection, they shed these structures, these oocysts into the environment, and they can contaminate fresh water, which makes its way to the ocean. We have become, uh, we have studied toxoplasma in the context of sea otter infections for decades in California, and that's because toxoplasma is a very important cause of death in sea otters. But it's also one of these parasites that has been found in uh, seafood, including oysters. And so we're very interested both in the effects this, par this parasite has on uh, wildlife like sea otters, but also people. So what happened when we're infected? Very often nothing. So asymptomatic infections are common, but the parasite can also cause flu-like disease and it can also be quite serious. It can cause neurologic disease, eye disease. It can cause uh, death if the inflammation or infection becomes severe enough. And some of us, some of you may be familiar in terms of this is the cat litter parasite and that's because it can cause abortion or miscarriage in women who are infected during pregnancy. So even though this kind of serious disease is not very common in the US, at least when it does occur, it can have really devastating consequences. The other two parasites might be more familiar to many of you, Cryptosporidium and Giardia cause diarrhea. So these are gastrointestinal parasites. They have very similar life cycles. So in general, when a person becomes infected, he will shed um, the parasites in stool and that can contaminate again waterways and food and make its way to the new host. 
This is a CDC life cycle. What this doesn't show you is that many animals can also serve as hosts for Cryptosporidium and Giardia. And CDC also doesn't show you um, shellfish, but both of these parasites have been detected in shellfish, including oysters from many regions around the world. So those are the parasites we're interested in. And the way that we designed our first study, which was meant to answer the question of whether these protozoan pathogens can associate with microplastics in seawater, is we took two types of microplastics. Microbeads, this was polystyrene microbeads and microfibers, which were polyester. And then we preconditioned them in seawater, which means that we allowed natural biofilm to form before the, the main experiment began. And then we took these plastics that have biofilms on them, put them in new seawater and added the parasite. And over one week, we sampled uh, aliquots from these jars and separated the material into plastics and surrounding water. And then we, we quantified the parasites and we can do this microscopically for toxoplasma, which looks blue like this under UV fluorescence, or Giardia, which is the bigger oval one, and Cryptosporidium, which is the smaller one, by using specific uh, antibodies that make the parasite glow green. So here are our results, and I will walk you through it. In short, the results from this experiment supported our hypothesis that pathogens do in fact become associated with biofilms and plastics. So this is the way this graph is um, portrayed here. So we have Cryptosporidium in orange, Giardia in green, and Toxoplasma in blue. And for each parasite, the darker color is the number of parasites on plastics, and the lighter color is the number of parasites on seawater. Okay, so um, you can see on day one, so this is just after the first day, that the vast majority of parasites were found in the seawater, and that's shown as significant by this asterisk. Let's just focus on toxoplasma to make this a little simpler to follow. So over time, from day one to seven, you can see a decrease in the number of toxoplasma in the seawater. And conversely, you can see an increase in the number of parasites that were coating the plastics. And this became significant by day seven. So this on its own was quite significant, but I do wanna show the data, the same data in a different context when you look at this in terms of concentration. This is the same data, but now in, instead of looking at the numbers of parasite, we're looking at the concentration of parasites per either gram of plastic or milliliter of seawater. And because the vast majority of our jars is seawater, even having a small number of parasites on the plastics makes that incredibly statistically significant when we think about gram per gram, where do you find the parasite? And this become, becomes very important in terms of thinking about the epidemiology and how the parasites move in the ocean. We also did a different set of experiments where we uh, looked at whether the plastic type makes a difference. And we used two different sizes of polystyrene microbeads and two different sizes of polyester microfibers. And the data was not that consistent, not 100% consistent for Toxoplasma, Giardia, and Cryptosporidium. But in general, the larger microfibers tended to, uh, to attract more of the pathogens. This is very important because most of the um, microplastics that we find, especially in seafood, is microfibers. So we thought that was quite important. Um, I also thought I would share these images because um, I think they're pretty beautiful and it's a, it's a very uh, telling picture. So we can look at what it looks like when the parasites become embedded in the biofilms that coat a microfiber. So this is the same image, just uh, less light, less bright feel on the right so that the parasites pop, pop out more and then more light on the left so you can see the plastic and the biofilm better. So the plastic this is a, a polyester microfiber is this pink uh, strand. We can uh, stain the plastics. That's why it looks red. And then again, use this special dye that colors biofilm um, blue. It colors these uh, sticky compounds inside the biofilm blue. And here's our toxoplasma oocysts. And here's Giardia right here. And here oh, I have some arrows to show that. 
Giardia in Toxo. And you can, you can really get the sense that this, these sticky molecules just trap the, the pathogens uh, inside. So in terms of understanding why this is important to disease transmission, we've answered our first question, which is that microplastics are capable of scavenging parasites in seawater on their sticky biofilms. And that might mean that they make these pathogens more bioavailable to invertebrates. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, it also means that because now these pathogens are stuck on these larger uh, complexes, and they can either be heavier or they can float large distances, they might change the transmission patterns of pathogens in the environment. And that depends on whether or not the plastic sinks or floats. So the veterinary student who worked on this project with me and was the first author on the paper put together this cartoon, which I think is a nice way of um, translating why is this important. So here is our uh, plastic. So this purple circle is supposed to um, portray a microplastic. And when it first comes into the ocean, it probably is not that sticky. But with time, it will uh, develop a biofilm, which is now this yellow stuff. And then let's say this microplastic ended up in a waterway that also has fecal parasites. Remember, Toxoplasma, Giardia, Cryptosporidium, they can end up in the same runoff where the plastics are from fecal pollution. So now this sticky plastic is going to scavenge these parasites. And because this particular plastic is heavy, it's going to sink. And it's going to deliver these pathogens to potentially uh, shellfish beds. And these shellfish may either be aquaculture beds that are intended for human consumption, or they may be prey for wildlife. Now, there's another scenario. Some plastics float very large distances because they don't sink right away. And in this case, we can have a plastic uh, um, part or particle that is introduced into the ocean in polluted water. So we have fecal pollution and plastic pollution. Here's the biofilm. The biofilm scavenges the parasites, but now the plastic can move a long way because it's floating and it's moving in currents. Eventually, most plastic particles, even if it floats for a long time, will eventually become heavy enough because it accumulates more and more debris that it eventually sinks. So in this situation, we have the ability of these microplastic particles to act as a dispersal mechanism, meaning that shellfish beds, whether it's aquaculture or just prey for wildlife that is located very far away from pollution. So let's say somewhere pristine, like, a, like an island or even the Arctic, even those areas can receive pathogens that may otherwise not have been able to be present in that ecosystem if they're able to float on plastic and remain viable for a long time. So I mentioned Emma Zeng, who was the veterinary student who led the experiments. When we published this work uh, a couple of years ago now, um, we got a lot of media attention and Emma even uh, made a showing on local news, which was quite exciting. So I just wanted to show her picture here and our, uh, this uh, study is published. Um, we did have two more aims in this uh, Sea Grant project, and the work has now been completed, and we're in the final stages of analyzing the data, and this will be hopefully published uh, relatively soon. So the second question that we have is whether or not pathogens that are associated with biofilms, here is a giardia that's stuck to a polyester fiber, whether there's some kind of survival that the, um, that the plastic confers to it. And that's because if they're embedded within biofilm, they may be less susceptible to degradation, for example, by UV radiation that can penetrate the top layers of, uh, of the ocean, of the seawater. So we're looking at that. And then we're also, um, we did a two sets of tank exposure experiments with oysters at Bodega Marine Lab to try to answer this question of, is it true that if pathogens are hitchhiking in plastics that they're more likely to enter the food chain and make their way into oysters? So that data should be uh, ready to share soon. And then in terms of addressing the needs of California, we definitely the questions that we're asking to specifically serve interests in California. And so one example is that the disease agents that we selected are particularly important in, in terms of their effects on people that live in California and on native 
uh, wildlife in California. I've mentioned sea otters. So uh, toxoplasma is a very important cause of death in sea otters, and it can also cause morbidity and mortality on other wildlife. And of course, none of us will want to get infected with this parasite um, if we are uh, pregnant or immunocompromised. And then specifically, our project addresses the sea grants focus area and healthy coastal ecosystem. And we've done that by providing new information to understand how anthropogenic stressors, in this case, microplastic pollution, can affect disease transmission that impacts coastal ecosystems in a changing environment. Hi, Karen. Okay. I'm just going to pop in to say we're at time. So just want to give you a oh, final moment to wrap I'm up. I'm sorry. I wasn't oh, able to check. You. I'm thank wrapping you. up. Um, we definitely think that more work is going to be needed to make this applied. And that's because this area of research is so new. We have to be able to do this bench top experiments first. But where we want to go next to make this more applied is put take all of our studies into the field to see what microplastics can accumulate in aquaculture, which pathogens are likely to be found in plastic, on plastic in California coastal waters, and what intervention approaches will be most effective. And um, my lab has been amazing in supporting all of this work, especially Emma, who was the first author, and Leslie and Minji, who did the experiments at Bodega Marine Lab. And I am very sorry I'm over time. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes. All right. Again, we'll hold questions. Uh, final panelist is Dr. Holly Bowers, research faculty with Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. Um, book ending our panel today with another um, presentation on harmful algal blooms and advancing portable detection capabilities of hab species in California waters. With that, um, thank you, Holly. Hi, everyone. You can see my slides and hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you for having this panel discussion. I'm over here feverishly writing notes and <laughs> getting ready for my talk. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about things that have already been discussed, which is great, great background for um, for me to move through my slides. Uh oh, it's not advancing. Okay. All right. So I have a few slides to give the background in terms of our rationale and approach for our particular um, project. So I really don't need to spend much time on this slide because Jamie gave such a great intro to HABs. And I know that most of us are, are all familiar with the events that have happened and transpired over the past really few decades uh, along the California coast. And this is just a picture of that big event in 2015 when we had the toxic uh, domoic acid uh, from Sudanichia. And as we all know, those toxins can get into the food web, which you've also already heard about. And then, of course, economies can be can suffer from that. So the Dungeness and rock um, crab fisheries were closed for quite a while from that event. So uh, really a lot of harm from the top to the bottom. And so our interest has been how to distinguish some of these species in samples, because several hab genera have species that look alike but they might not necessarily produce the same amount of toxins. So the uh, picture on the top left of Australis was the culprit in the 2015 big toxic event. Interestingly, two years before that, we had a giant fraudulenta bloom, but we didn't really hear much about that because it doesn't produce a lot of toxins. And so, but when you look under the light microscope, as you can tell, it's really hard to distinguish these guys also with Alexandria, and that's a dinoflagellate that can produce a toxin and get into the food web as well. So the middle picture shows a couple of species there. You can tell it's kind of hard to distinguish them. And then off to the right is a typical net toe picture where not only do you have these species that you can't distinguish from each other, but then you throw them in a mix of all this other stuff and this becomes really difficult. So our interests have been in uh, genetic identification. And so this bottom snippet of DNA just is it's from a very short piece of the genome from the two Sudanichia species that show that you can go after these genes uh, and differentiate. So our project background um, and our really our approach to this is there's a lot of steps here. This is a lot of steps con um, uh, concise on one slide, but overall the, the goals are to be rapid, robust, and have real-time results. And so some of these methods you've already heard about a little bit, but obviously first we want to collect our sample, um, some sort of net toe or uh, a Van Dorn type 
or even the surface um, bucket grab sample. And you want to also work through your methods for extracting DNA and how do you do that in the field? Sometimes it involves your car. Uh, and so then you want to get into gene amplification. You've heard a little bit about qPCR. And so that's basically a big gamish of different components that you would put in a tube. And then you put it uh, into a uh, some sort of platform to run your cycling and amplify your gene of target. And so we were lucky enough to obtain this um, handheld qPCR device as part of a, um, a proposal out of the, of the company. They had a, con a competition to see who could win one. And so then you wanna actually be able to look at your results, of course. So in the far right, you have some sort of visualization. And so um, we have there uh, in the upper right, it shows some, some amplification, just a typical um, graph that you get. And then what's neat about this instrument is you can see your um, reaction running on either your iPad or your iPhone. So it's, it's really conducible to go out into the field. So I'm just going to run through quickly some proof of concept examples that we did over the past several years. So we are custodians of the Monterey Wharf sampling site, which is part of Cal HabMap, and that's nine stations along the California coast that go out on the same day each week to sample with a real focus on the presence of HAB species, as well as ancillary data. And then those data become publicly available um, for all kinds of stakeholders. So this was one instance where we were out uh, right next to where we had collected the water and my RU student that summer, Cami, she was going through the process of figuring out all the different uh, parts of the protocol and how we could literally do that in the back of a car. And we've also supported the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute or Mbari. So a few years ago, they had a large um, campaign of assets they wanted to put out into Monterey Bay. And they were really focused on the presence of Pseudonuchia species because they were working with scripts to look at the genetics uh, of the toxin pathway that had really just come out in publication. And so they had, wanted some pre-deployment reconnaissance. So we were able to get some samples from them during the day. I ran them at home and I could have um, some results to them by the end of the day. So that helped to guide their next day operations. So they weren't having to run around in the bay, but they kind of knew what area to go to. Uh, I've also had a couple of interns working with me at the Monterey Bay Aquarium a couple of times. So the aquarium is interested in testing their seawater intake because that supplies the tanks that house their filter feeders. And they do have a, a filtration, a coarse filtration that they put in uh, to effect, but we wanted to see, is it really working or are these toxic cells making it in? And the good news was that the, uh, although the QPCR was positive for Pseudonychia at that raw intake, after that coarse filtration, it was negative. So they could really feel like, you know, that was um, an effective uh, measurement for, um, for uh, seeing how their filtration does. Uh, I had also participated once in the um, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Snapshot Day. And so that's when citizen scientists go out and collect samples from streams on the same day, once per year. And they gather all kinds of parameters, especially nutrients. I think they count some zo zooplankton and things like that. And that's really used in part to generate their sanctuary condition uh, reports. And so I promise I was out there. I, I'm always bad about getting um, pictures of myself in the field, but uh, so I work, worked alongside them. I grabbed some water and I was able to um, run qPCR in the field. Likewise, I met an old colleague uh, who used to work at the Santa Cruz Water Quality Lab, and that lab was interested in testing routine lake sites for microcystis. And so I was able to take a split of this very green water here, take it back to my car in the parking lot and kind of run through the motions and run just a general cyanobacterial test on it with qPCR. Um, in 2020, I did a short stint over at Cawthron in New Zealand, and we were chasing Alexandrium in the Polaris Sound. So this is a very long monitoring program, I think a couple of years um, long now, and they wanna measure the impacts from land-based activities. So one of the things they look at is HABs. You'll notice our instrument here is a little different. I had um, a loner QPCR Liberty 16 with me. However, um, this was post COVID and they needed all their machines back. So this was another um, uh, small instrument they had that we were able to take out 
uh, on the boat. We've also had a couple of outreach uh, um, efforts in terms of um, in-person and also virtual. So every year, the uh, CENCU, Central and Northern California Ocean Observing um, Group, along with SCUS, they put on these annual meetings to bring um, together a lot of stakeholders, uh, managers, researchers, program leads. It's a really great meeting. And this was uh, at the end of one of the days, long days of talks, I was able to set up the portable device and demonstrate it at our happy hour. So that was fun. Uh, I've also had it at a couple of our um, Moss Landing Marine Labs open houses. And so we really get a variety of ages and demographics, people from literally all over come through. It's pretty fun. And so you can see in the on the left picture, we had some students come through that were from a university in the Bay Area, I can't remember which, but they're familiar with PCR, but they were um, really, it was really cool for them to see it and uh, that you could do it portable in the field. And then this is actually somebody from Senkus who came through and we were actually kind of had a one on one conversation and that was nice to see um, how this instrument works. And so the company I mentioned, um, Ubiquitome, is the one that um, developed this platform. And I've kept in touch with them for, um, for several years now. And this is kind of an example of industry engagement. So a lot of these platforms, it's not like they just sell it to you and you're off and running and that's it. They really want to engage with you and see how you're using it and how they might be able to tweak the next iteration. So they held a webinar in late 2019. It was interactive and um, we were able to introduce the platform to you know, different sectors and, and answer questions about how it does in the field. Um, I've also spoken with the um, California Molecular Methods Working Group and uh, gave them a virtual seminar a few years ago now. Again, a hand, couple dozen participants uh, from California and also beyond. And this group is really focused on uh, molecular methods in environmental studies and uh, monitoring. So I really wanted to uh, spend a bit of time on uh, sort of some related um, efforts that I have that really tie into, uh, I was happy to hear about the proceedings that will come out of this. So I'm representative of the HAB uh, community on an international level in terms of very specific qPCR technology. And so we are a working group that has been online about four times now meeting and then we finally met in person a couple months ago. And so we have several objectives which tie in because no matter if we're doing this on a on a small scale or global scale, we all have the same questions. And so our objectives are establishing how qPCR as well as digital PCR could be used in the monitoring of HABs, uh, selecting target species to be monitored with qPCR at a global scale, also agreeing on some common protocols adapted to have monitoring systems. So not so much a one size fits all, but what kind of guidance can we give? Um, and so that ties into the next bullet with elaborating on international guidelines talking about water volume filtration, target species primers to use, protocols, data interpretation. And so we really wanna have this consensus global voice. And so we did have a presentation a couple months ago to the HAB community. We have a position paper in progress and I'm really excited because we're working on some shared curriculum. And you can see here a picture out of my uh, colleagues lab last year where we're talking about having these qPCR workshops that last about a week long. And so I, I could easily host two or two to five people in my lab and be able to teach qPCR from the ground up. So some of the general themes that I've heard about, especially when talking with my colleagues from other countries, they really have sustained support via the government for everything from the validation steps, getting accredited, and then support with their personnel and lab facilities. And when I've pulled my US colleagues, um, I've found that very few routine monitoring programs include any genetics, much less qPCR. A lot of it's limited use where it's an event that's happened and then you get a bunch of samples and maybe some money and you can dive in with these different um, techniques 
or also maybe a defined project. So really here, microscopy and imaging platforms are common in terms of monitoring. Again, the genetics come in when you have specific projects going on. And so on a, on a national scale, uh, we think about integration all the time. And so I'm sure you've heard the um, program IUS under NOAA, and then under NOAA, there's, or under IUS, there's another sort of blanket um, program, the National Harmful Algal Bloom Observing Network, otherwise known as NABON. And so we're always thinking about how to integrate new technology. So this is something we just got funded for, which is an imager. And how can we use this cheaper imager to maybe go to an aquaculture facility and we can see what's in the water and then we can do something more like um, qPCR or, or toxin analysis, something like that. So just my final thoughts when I was putting together these slides on management integration, um, upfront costs are always a, a big deal and also expectations and limitations. So there's really expertise needed. It's not a pull things off the shelf, put them together and start running. Um, there's a lot of nuance, especially to qPCR, I'm sure all of these other techniques you hear about and also transparency and understanding. So what can we do and what can we not do? And let's you know be honest about all of that. Um, and also I mentioned the sustained versus rapid resp response funding. So having you know that sustained uh, funding beyond an event. So gaps in funding, of course, are gaps in data and that's not uh, useful down the road. Also support for the unseen. Just during my project period, I've had an incubator go down, personnel changes, supply chain issues. And so that sets you back sometimes. And also leveraging connections. So I mentioned how a lot of us keep in touch with these companies that have these platforms and they really want feedback. And so that can really benefit all from the manufacturer all the way through to the end user, um, as well as our international collaborations. And finally, um, investments in training the next generation, because really, if you invest the, those monies, you know, it's one thing to have a, a genetics class, but it's another to be able to have that hands-on um, expertise uh, that you build up with uh, the next generation of folks that are going to come along for these um, entry level jobs and move through the uh, system and have those skills to um, be able to, you know, support everything. With that, and Holly, yeah. are you? I was going to say we are at time, so it's a prompt for wrapping up. Yep, Don't that was it. So wonderful, thank you. Well, fantastic. Thank you all so much. I'm just going to reiterate, uh, feel, feel free for those uh, um, in the audience, please do enter your question in the Q&A section. Also open the floor. Um, please hand, raise your hand if you prefer to ask your question verbally, but I will start with one moderated question um, to each of the panelists and then we'll open up the floor. So with that, uh, just reflecting on the presentations we just heard, I heard a couple of different themes um, related to best practices when it comes to designing a project for that research to application. Again, coming back to today's theme, I heard themes of having understanding of the regulatory context. For example, Dr. J, you discussed a lack of standardized methods um, in a regulatory context, as well as early and often engagement with management agencies. Thank you, uh, Jamie, for, for that insight. So I'd like to open to the panel for um, speaking to the new and early career researchers and colleagues in the room, could you share your best practices or lessons learned in applied research? Uh, specifically, do you have recommendations that you would share with early career researchers? Um, with that, I think I'll go in reverse order. So I'll start with Holly, Holly Bowers. Wow, I would say, first of all, take advantage of the time you have before all the paperwork and administrative tests um, hit you and all of a sudden you're in front of your laptop more than you're at the lab bench but that's actually a serious um, consideration because you know diving into the literature and um, learning all you can and networking and you know now that we do a lot of things virtual you know being able to attend anything you can i think just really soaking it all in and hearing all different perspectives thinking about it you're really thinking through what you've heard and also how that ties into um a career but also you know a career path and so yeah i think that would be sort of my very overall arching just soak it all in Wonderful. With that, I'll turn to Karen Shapiro. 
Yeah, I think that's a really important question. I um, So drawing from this particular study, for example, the importance of reaching out to other experts and working collaboratively, collaboratively really can't be overestimated. Like this was really key in making our study be relevant. So especially that study I shared with you, which was a uh, bench top, we artificially are spiking seawater in the lab. We've introduced both the plastics and the parasites. It's easy to think about a dozen, you know, or more different approaches to how we design our study. But for the results to be meaningful and especially relevant for the system in California, you really need to tailor your study to ask what are the plastics that are most relevant? What are the pathogens that are most relevant? I'm a parasitologist. I don't do not have expertise in plastics, so really reaching out to the experts in plastic research and those people that have specifically looked at what microplastics are present in California and in aquaculture was super important. Uh, and the next set of experiments, which I did not get to share with you today, involve tank studies with oysters, and I don't have expertise in how to maintain oysters in tanks. So that was very important for us to reach out to. Um, we worked with shellfish physiologists at the uh, Bodega Marine Lab, but more importantly, even was aquaculture producers. And we're really lucky to have found an amazing farm who is working with us in helping us design our studies so that we're keeping oysters in conditions that are realistic of what they're doing for their industry. So um, I think that's that. those are my, my two pieces of advice is reaching out to other experts and working with relevant stakeholders in the state. Fantastic, thank you. I'll turn to Jenny. Uh, yeah, so I would um, just say that you can really get a lot of insight on necessary questions by going to those advocacy groups. Um, so we've worked with, you know, Heal the Bay, and surf rider and also community groups, environmental justice groups, and that it might take several contacts. Like that, depending on the group, it can be it can be difficult. They might already be overburdened, not have enough staff, swimming in email like all of us. So you don't want to take the first lack of response necessarily as and to mean anything, and just keep trying. And it takes a, a just a long time to build up trust that. You really are in it for the longer haul and um, yeah, that you're going to stick with it. And so you show that by maybe repeated <laughs> polite emails <laughs> until, until you can establish the relationships. That's wonderful. And last but not least, Jamie. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. I think that all of what, what you all said was great. And um, I think that, I think that uh, Jenny just, paying off of what you said is on the on the not not just the the NGOs and the advocacy uh, advocacy groups, but also the managers in in kind of state board type positions, for example, uh, building relationships with those folks and treating them as your research partner to help you, you know, in in the example that I gave, we we integrated them into doing the work with us. And that was then, you know, paid out in integrating that into their into the strategic plan that the state board eventually made to deal with HABs. And so uh, creating a research partnership with managers to where they're helping at like very early on, not 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 when you get the RFP, right, for a proposal, but like before that, create the relationship and and kind of create a shared vision for, you know, what needs to be done and you know, share your expertise and hear hear kind of back the challenges that they're dealing with in in addressing your particular area of water quality, I think is is really great. And understanding, you know, that was said already, understanding kind of the regulatory framework for that particular issue is really important as well. Very well said to all of you. Thank you so much. Right now, I am not seeing any written Q&A, but I will open up the floor uh, for those who might have any follow-up questions. Please do raise your hand. I'll... I'm going to pause a moment and just take a look. All right. Well, 
I'll give folks more time to think of questions, raise your hand. And with that, I'm gonna to move to another moderated question. Uh, just keeping an eye on time. So maybe it's one more. Let's see. So we had a good research application question. I'll make this a little more, still very broad uh, because of the number of um, different water quality topics, but related. I mean, certainly we're looking at similar techniques of monitoring, et cetera, but, um, oh, we did receive one audience question. Therefore, I will pause. I wanna give the audience uh, time to ask questions. So this is a question for Jamie. Is SPAT only available for inland um, fresh water? Oh, no, SPAT is uh, available across ecosystems, so it works well across the salinity gradient. Uh, so it's it's just interesting. It was actually a technology that was that was uh, developed for marine systems and monitoring and shellfish beds, but it then was kind of migrated over into freshwater systems where a lot of the uh, our state board partners actually use them in their routine monitoring, but it works across a variety of, of aquatic systems and on a variety of harmful algal bloom toxins. Thank you. This is another uh, question that actually came from pre-registration is, um, and also ties potentially to a follow-up moderator question. So. We spoke to the best practices and research uh, to application. Let's kind of switch to the barriers as far as are there information needs that you as a researcher have about management practices or engagement in research to application? So I think it's a little bit more about the information needs from your perspective. You spoke kind of flipping the question on barriers. And Holly, I believe you spoke to this a bit in your in your presentation. So I'll just open the floor um, to the panelists to come off mute and answer. I, I can suggest one perspective. Um, so I, I mentioned that we're really lucky to be working with uh, one aquaculture farm and I'm very grateful for that. Um, on the other hand, when we have reached to additional farms to try to increase sample size, when we do surveillance type studies, we've mostly been running into people that um, I think are cautious of either working with academics, but even more so water um, seafood quality, because what we might find in their products can harm their, um, not reputation, because we never make it available in, in any kind of communication who they are, but the perception of what food is safe and, and the risks associated with foods can be really harmful to industry owners. And we try as much as possible to reassure them that our findings are not gonna be published in a context that would allow any identification of who they are or where their products were um, sampled from. But still, like we have, we have hit some uh, roadblocks in terms of being able to broaden surveillance type studies because of that hesitancy. And that's something that at this point, I'm not quite sure how to overcome. So I, I would welcome any input. And we do work with Sea Grant Extension. I, I would just say that like they're our first uh, person who, who we go to and the extension specialists usually do help link us with the producers, but then it, it can't move forward because of that hesitancy of wanting to work with us. Thank you. Holly, you came off mute. Yeah, I would just say that, yeah, that sometimes the pipelines can be a little jaggedy. And I think it's just because, you know, like I mentioned, you have the manufacturers, developers, and then you have the researchers, and then you have the stakeholders. And there are various meetings that occur, and we have lots of great ideas, but sometimes it's just hard to follow through on those uh, connections. And it just, a lot of times it's just a timing issue. Um, and, you know, you can discuss things and then it takes a really long time to, to move through that whole pipeline and get to the end. And then sometimes you have, you know, somebody leaves the field. And so then there's a new person, you gotta get them up to speed. And so I think that can be um, a hindrance or at least slow things down a bit.
Wonderful. We have three minutes remaining. I'm, I'm hesitant because I feel like we could <laughs> easily then go over time. But I think if, uh, just a final question um, just regarding looking to the future, um, and maybe just one or two panelists will we'll limit it to a one minute statement as regarding the most pressing water quality challenges um, in, from your perspective in your field. And what is needed essentially um, to shape a successful application to address these challenges. So it's a, in a way, this that's why I'm pausing this, I'm looking at time, but also the question is similar to the best practices, but specific to water quality. I always go to sustain funding um, because I, I see it working well in, in overseas with some of my colleagues in their countries and it really keeps things streamlined. So that's my, my number one. Yeah, I would second that. I think from harmful algal bloom perspective, there's these kind of like infusions of money when there's an event, for example, or we're piecing together, you know, I mentioned that we have this 20 year time series of probably, you know, 15 different research proposals that are supporting that over time with little gaps in the middle. So sustained funding is a huge challenge. And we've mentioned it before, but lack of standardized methods is is a big hindrance. So so then a wish list would just be more money toward method development and cross validation. I see we have a minute. I will just say I support <laughs> what the other panelists said. And, and the sustained funding, I, I think, is especially important when we have efforts that really need multiple phases, like proof of concept. I think we've done that. But we the application, you really need field studies. And right now, we've been a little bit um, short on just being able to, to get that next part funded. And without that, getting to the application, is, I don't think is going to be possible. Well, thank you all. It was a wonderful hour plus panel, very informative, and I think some very concrete recommendations, um, best practices from your experience. So again, thank you for sharing your perspectives in that space. With that, I'm uh, pleased to hand over to our panel two moderator, Karina Alvarez with the OCC grant. Great, thank you, Caitlin. And thank you to all of our panel one panelists for a great first panel and for kicking off the workshop to such a great start. Uh, like Caitlin said, my name is Karina Alvarez. I'm a science research and policy specialist with USCC grant, and I focus on coastal resilience. So I'm really excited to introduce this and moderate this next panel focusing precisely on that topic. I'm also thinking today, even as I look right now, it's started to pour again. Um, what a great day it is to talk about this topic. Um, in Southern California, it's been pouring pretty hard. Um, and so I find myself thinking about what else this El Nino winter will bring us, perhaps in the shape of coastal flooding, coastal erosion, what that means for infrastructure and for people, so on and so forth. And it seems like it's front of mind for a lot of people, not just people here today. Uh, USCC grant just recently administered the fourth iteration of our statewide coastal practitioner survey. And we found that for the second time in a row, coastal hazards remain the top concern for coastal practitioners across the state. So the need for solid science to inform management and decision-making in this space is, is really clear. So I'm really thrilled to have three excellent scientists here today to talk about what their role is and, and how they've supported these management decisions through their research. So today we have Dr. Patrick Barnard from the US Geological Survey. We have Dr. Adam Young from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And we have Professor Ian Walker from UC Santa Barbara. Now, before I pass it off to Dr. Barnard, I want to again invite people to add their questions to the Q&A um, as the presentations are ongoing or um, in the question session. Feel free to raise your hand um, if you have something that comes to mind. So without further ado, I'll pass it off to Patrick so that he can share about his work on helping Californians understand groundwater hazards. Thanks, Priya. Let's see if I can share real quick here. Okay, we're we looking okay? Looks good. 
All right, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, the USCC grant just been an amazing partner for over a decade now for myself and other folks in my group. And, um, you know, beginning with Phyllis and then um, other folks, Juliet Finzi Hart, Melissa Mann, Nick Sajapur, and others who some have moved on, some still there. But just been an amazing, you know, boundary organization partner that has really contributed to a lot of success that we've had as scientists and being able to turn our science into action. So it's been a wonderful relationship. Then also a huge thanks to OPC for the funding for this work um, and just the recognition of the need to really translate um, sea level rise information to coastal hazards. And they've been a great partner. Also just note here, another boundary organization, Point Blue Conservation Science, um, which has also really helped us develop user tools um, and, and more effective ways to communicate science. And so I think while well, I'm going to talk a bit about the science here of coastal hazards and groundwater hazards, I mean, hopefully the thread comes through that partnering with these boundary organizations is really critical um, to success and, and developing and investing in out, stakeholder engagement outreach is, is a huge part of the scientific process and cannot be overlooked. So we've become more aware of the episodic impacts of storms across the California coast, um, particularly the El Nino events like in 82, 83 and 2015, 16. And we're becoming more keenly aware as well that even in non El Nino winters, we're having more significant impacts along the California coast, coastal flooding, coastal erosion. Um, and this has been never more apparent than the last couple of storm seasons. Um, for example, the very large storm in January of 2023, which affected the entire state and then the recent storm um, just la in the last month, which also had similar impacts um, in many parts of the state, in particular the Central Coast. And so we're becoming uh, more aware of how to um, basically plan for these sorts of impacts and also to plan for the more um, predictable impacts, um, such as king tides, which have been now well recognized across the state um, for about a decade or so. Um, but as we move forward, um, now we're going to have to think about these different hazards riding on top of, of sea level rise. And so as a, as a research program at USGS, you know, we sought to, to develop products to address at least several of these um, coastal hazards, um, especially associated with climate change. So more frequent and severe coastal flooding, um, beach erosion, cliff failures. And then there's some other topics which we've started to touch on a bit, saltwater intrusion, um, coastal squeeze. And then also the relevance of all this work in terms of equity, environmental justice, and how as a science agency, we can address those challenges. So, you know, over a decade ago now, we developed the coastal storm modeling system to look at the impact of flooding on the California coast, um, but also the complementary hazards of, of coastal change. So beach erosion, cliff retreat, and ultimately, as I'll get to um, looking at groundwater hazards. So, We've developed this system to look at um, hazards along the coast, going from the global scale and then, and then downscaling models down the local scale so we could develop management relevant tools um, that could directly support decision making. And so this is both a, a major scientific effort. And so we had to develop the foundational science to support this approach. And we've been doing that quite a bit over, the, over recent decades. Um, but then also on the back end, how does this information get served up to the public? How does it get served up so agencies can actually use the information? And so a lot of user-driven tool development um, with boundary organizations and with other agencies across the state to make sure that we're putting something out that people can actually integrate into their planning process. Another key issue here is making the science uh, directly actionable and relevant. Um, and so having the relevant sea level rise scenarios, ones that line up with what the, the, the guidance is. And so what we've done with Cosmos is make sure that our sea level rise scenarios line up with the federal guidance, which also is going to line up with the new state guidance, which will be coming out in 2024. Um, OPC sea level rise guidance draft just went out for public comment on Friday. And so not just having this information being um, available, accessible, but to make it actionable, it has to line up with the guidance that people are using. Otherwise, it's not going to be irrelevant. So taking those sea level rise projections, taking all the different forcing parameters into the model and into consideration and put, spitting out scenarios that can directly feed into the planning process was a crucial F, uh, sort of step in what we were doing. And to figure all these things out, it really required a massive investment in outreach and communication with state agencies, local agencies, to, to figure out how we can make this work for everybody. Um, not a one size fits all. So we had to develop 
flexible tools and really user-friendly tools that could be used um, by many different people from general public um, to sort of more sophisticated state agency folks um, so they could put this in their planning process. And so one of these efforts was the Our Coast, Our Future tool, which was developed by Point Blue Conservation Science with lots of beta testing by many of you over the years. And so this is a means to serve up these flooding results and the coastal erosion results and ultimately the groundwater results, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, on the fly, um, we've got hundreds of gigabytes of data here in this Google Earth type interface where folks can go in, they can choose whatever sea level rise scenario they want, whatever storm scenario they want, and then begin clicking through scenarios to look at tipping points, to look at the timing of when various aspects of their infrastructure um, will be exposed to flooding hazards or erosion hazards, depending which hazard you're interested in, up and down the California coast. And the next step, though, was kind of the so what factor. You're like, what does this actually mean in, in terms of societal relevance of these types of exposure to hazards? And so we developed a hazard exposure reporting analytics tool um, led by Nate Wood in our Western Geographic Science Center to translate this exposure into dollars and lives. And this really put that so what, the finer point on what all this actually meant to the state. And this was done initially as part of California's fourth climate change assessment. And so we can show you know, what are in some ways esoteric 2D flood maps of the Bay Area of the whole state. But what does it actually mean? Well, in California, what this means by the end of century, we could be looking at, you know, over half a million residents and hundreds of billions of dollars of property on that risk. And this is the kind of information that goes up through the governor's office and can actually make some important um, policy statements and ultimately influence the direction of policy. And so with all these interactions, we've been able to have an investment in outreach and it's been transformative for us um, as an agency and as a program at USGS. We definitely did not within our program grasp the, the importance of stakeholder engagement, outreach, and also boundary organizations that can span um, science and policy. And we've invested much more heavily than we had. We had almost zero investment prior to interfacing with the USCC grant. Uh, beginning about 10 years ago. And since then, we have now five communications and outreach people dedicated to coastal climate hazards, um, hired uh, director of outreach specifically for Cosmos, first Juliet Finzi Hart, and now Maya Hayden, who've been instrumental in getting this information in more and more rooms and get it into the hands of more and more agencies so they can use this information to make decisions. Um, currently, several hundred agencies are using the information. It's been used um, at California state and California state politics and legislature in particular um, to help move legislation, such as the $4 billion spending package that was passed by Newsom back in 2021. Um, it's also been used uh, for operational storm response uh, for both El Nino type storms, but also for hurricanes. And more broadly for agencies that have much larger reach beyond the state of California, such as the National Park Service, such as Department of Defense. And all this really is uh, is due to the realization, which really Sea Grant instilled in us, of how important it is to have these boundary organizations help us with the politics, um, help us navigate very complicated government structures like the city of L.A., um, et cetera. So it's really been cri a critical piece of what we've done over the years now. And so it has, we have been able to branch out beyond California and just a, just a quick aside here now, basically we have footprints for Cosmos across the United States um, in, in various uh, aspects of completion, but um, really moving forward toward na a national view of coastal hazards, not just California anymore. Many thanks to all the lessons that we learned um, in the state of California. Um, but in all this work, you know, one thing we knew was, we realized was missing was this, complementary hazard of the water table response to sea level rise. And so OPC stepped up, Sea Grant stepped up to advocate for us to, to make this happen. And the general concept is that we have a very shallow water table along the coast. It is generally controlled by sea level. And so as sea level rises, that water table is gonna rise as well. In some cases, it's gonna form ponds or, or just shallow hazards that are gonna be a threat to infrastructure and people um, up and down the state. So we wanted to develop a modeling approach to look at the response of the water table to sea level rise along the coast and look at the, the exposure um, moving forward with these different sea level rise scenarios. 
And so we partnered with Kevin Beefus at University of Arkansas, and we developed a series of groundwater models using mod flow across the state to look at that response of the water table to sea level rise, and then develop continuous output data sets um, to look at where the groundwater table was going to be much shallower, or in fact, where it was going to emerge uh, at the ground surface. And so this also goes into OCOF, so it's very easily accessible and people can use this in the planning process and the same concept where you have these different sea level rise scenarios, you can click through and look at how shallow that water table is gonna be in the future um, with these different, um, different levels. And similarly, again, we wanted to translate information um, into exposure of people and dollars. And this is done through the HERA tool as well, um, much like the overland flooding work. Now, the take home message here is that there's all these different hazards related to groundwater. Um, there can be flooding of basements, damage to pipelines, um, and, and other buried infrastructure, fiber optic cables, gas lines can undermine foundations of homes and roadbeds. It can liberate pollutants um, and many other potential hazards. And what we found, though, in relation to the overland flooding, and this is really the, the big take home message here is that the exposure to groundwater hazards over the next century or so is about 10 times higher uh, than overland flooding. And so it's that doesn't necessarily mean that the impacts are commensurate. However, it, it definitely shows that it's at least of the same order of magnitude um, as overland flooding. It has to be considered holistically with all these other hazards when we do climate adaptation um, along the California coast and make these big investments and nature-based solutions and hard solutions, whatever they be, they have to consider the range of hazards that we're gonna encounter as sea level continues to rise. So this begs the question of, you know, all these sort of end member ideas of how to respond to sea level rise, but, you know, what about groundwater? How are these strategies gonna work inland and what are the actual impacts gonna be? So we have to think about our strategies again, moving forward. So just to kind of summarize the best practices that we've learned um, over the years now and trying to, to produce actionable science, um, we've put ourselves in as many rooms as possible. And sometimes these are um, uncomfortable. Sometimes we're just there to only to listen. Um, and we should be listening more and more, especially as a federal agency. Um, we want to engage early in foundational science so that oftentimes what we learn in, in a lot of these meetings is the direction or the gaps that have to be filled from a scientific perspective and build up that foundation so we can then develop more applied products in the future. Uh, we have to be upfront, transparent with expectations and communication. Um, most significantly, investing in stakeholder engagement and communication capacity. This is critical even for a science agency. This, and I think the pendulum has really swung quite a bit in the last 10 years or so, but we still need to invest much, much more in delivering science and not just producing science. Um, leaning on boundary organizations, like I've said over and over here, is just critical to tap on the expertise of, of these experts who know how to navigate complicated policy world that's out there, which um, scientists are certainly not taught in graduate school. Um, Users, user driven design of products and tools. If the science can't be used, then really no point to it. We've been fortunate to have a very responsive staff. Um, we get technical questions on a weekly basis, and we have the luxury of being in the fed federal agency with baseline funding that we have the capacity to do that, and we should be doing that. And then lastly, planning for what happens after the science is done. And again, this is where the boundary organizations have been really helpful in that. Regardless of which way the political winds are blowing, we have a lot of data entrusted with Point Blue, with Sea Grant. You know, no matter what happens politically in, in Washington, we have these trusted agencies can keep the science um, products out there. And lastly, just a, a note on the EJ side, you know, this has become much more of a focus in the federal government and beyond the last four years. And some agencies have obviously been doing this much, much longer, but as a science agency, we often look at the classical definition of environmental justice and think that, you know, what is our place in this world? You know, we don't make laws, we're not a regulatory agency, um, we don't set policy, but, you know, our role um, as, as a science agency in the USGS is to deliver information that's accessible to the public. And so 
I often call this um, you know, the four A's of EJ. And so making the data available is, is absolute the lowest rung of the ladder. It's, it's a no brainer. It's very, very easy. Um, that doesn't really do anything. The question is, are constituents aware of the data and can they get to the data? Is it accessible? And so it has to be accessible. And then if it's accessible, is it actionable? So are the scenarios relevant? Is the guidance relevant? Can people actually use this information to make decisions? So all this really kind of is foundational to what I talked about the rest of the talk in terms of interacting with folks, understanding their needs and delivering what they need um, as a science agency, not just spitting out um, peer reviewed publications and calling it good. So with that, I'll wrap up. I think I'm about a minute or so over. So really appreciate, again, C Grant support. And this is just a quick summary of what I just talked about. So I don't need to take any more time. I really appreciate um, your attention and I um, look forward to the next two talks too. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was a great presentation. And I really enjoyed that um, the summary slides, particularly the four A's um, of environmental justice. So thank you. I'll now pass it off to Dr. Adam Young, who will talk about beach cobbles and beach stability. So I think, Patrick, if you stop sharing your screen, perfect. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about something on much different scales, talk about um, rocks moving on beaches. So um, this is some work that was mostly funded by USC Grant, where we were um, starting to take a look at cobbles and how they're moving at, at Torrey Pine State Beach. And I just want to acknowledge um, my co-authors, Hiro Matsumoto, Mark Dixon, and Matt Spidell. So um, cobbles are not well studied compared to maybe some of our other um, sandy shorelines. Um, however, there are a lot of cobble, particularly in Southern California. If you were to come down to uh, San Diego um, right now, you'll see a lot of our beaches do look like this picture right here. Um, we've lost a lot of sand over the last couple of years. Um, and so it's important to study cobbles and understand how they influence our beach. Um, in some cases, cobbles um, make up almost the entire beach as shown in this picture. So. Um, they can also provide some natural shoreline protection, but there are some um, negative impacts that we also want to consider as well. Um, so these are some of the reasons that we want to better understand cobble dynamics on our beaches. Um, so cobbles are, are quite interesting. Um, when we have large wave events, sand and cobble actually tend to do different things. Um, so when large waves interact with the shoreline, they tend to pull sand offshore, but then they can push the cobble up onto the backshore into these large cobble berms. And when they're large enough, they can actually help um, prevent waves from uh, causing backshore erosion or flooding. And so that's what makes them a um, attractive for a potential na nature-based shoreline protection method. So on the left-hand side here is, this is a cobble berm in South Carlsbad State Beach that is uh, very stable and persistent over the last few years. It's continuing to grow. Um, and an example on the right is a cross-section of a living shoreline project where they're using cobble um, as part of the engineered construction. So these are becoming more and more common as using cobble as an element for shoreline protection. Um, here's an example of, um, this is at Sandy Hill State Beach, which is was having a chronic erosion problem. And um, a small cobble pile was placed in this area to try to stabilize the shoreline and prevent further erosion. So people are using um, cobble in these both like larger scale living shoreline projects as well as small cobble piles. Um, at a variety of scales to try to slow down and stabilize the shoreline. Um, however, cobble doesn't always stay where you want it to. So on the left-hand side here are some images um, of a storm in 1980. Um, so large waves were able to uh, pick up the cobbles and actually throw them into structures in Oceanside, 
causing damage. And in one instance, there were so many cobbles piled up onto a roof that it actually caused it to collapse. Um, something else to consider is um, when cobble is in like relatively small quantities and we don't have a large cobble burn that's able per to protect the shoreline, the waves can actually mobilize that cobble and use it as an abrasive to, to erode the shoreline. Um, a couple other things to consider. Um, cobbles are really hard to walk on. So some people call this the cobble wobble. Um, and these are not preferred areas for, for tourists. Um, and this can cause access issues on our coastline. So on the top right hand side here is a is a wheelchair access ramp at Torrey Pines, which routinely gets um, uh, many cobbles on it and becomes impassable. Um, that that bar there, that's a handrail. So you can see there's about uh, three or four feet of cobble in this particular area. On the bottom left here is a, a stairway that's getting engulfed by, by a large cobble berm. And then on the bottom right here, this is Cardiff State Beach, uh, where the cobbles have moved onto the parking lot, causing it to be closed. This is actually fairly common at this parking lot and a few others um, in the San Diego region. Um, which, you know, they lose money from having to close the parking lot, but then they also have to clean all this up routinely. And there are other issues with biological impacts. For example, um, we have grunion that, that, you know, cobble can interrupt their, um, their, their natural processes when they're looking for sand in the back of the beach. Um, <clears throat> Lagoons can also be impacted by cobble. This is Los Penasquillas Lagoon. We have a large cobble feature here pushing into the lagoon mouth. So these can um, tend to cause closures of the lagoon and interrupt uh, lagoon dynamics and biological communities inside the lagoon. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, Torrey Pines, which is where the study was focused. Um, it, Torrey Pines is a pretty dynamic beach. Um, in the summers, it's typically sandy, and then um, it can transition relatively quickly to a, a cobble beach in the wintertime. Um, and this is sort of a, a typical pattern we see. However, over the last couple of years, there's been pretty persistent cobble in this area. But just an example of how dynamic the system is. Um, so some of the things that we're doing um, in San Diego, we do collect routine LIDAR data across much of the county, and we have developed some automated methods um, to detect cobble um, using the LIDAR intensity. Um, so this image on the right just shows you an example of how that's done. Um, well, one of the things, um, again, these are just looking at uh, cobble on the surface of our beach, but we can apply this um, to regional scales. An example of Torrey Pines, again, of just how dynamic the system is. Uh, the x-axis here is the longshore location. The y-axis is, is the percent cobble. So again, you have very little cobble in November and then can transition very quickly um, to 20 to 50% cobble just a few weeks later. So it's very dynamic, but we don't know a lot about how the cobble is moving around. So again, these this type of method to, to map the cobble out is really only detecting cobble on the surface, but we don't know how cobble is actually moving around. So that was sort of the reason why we started um, this study is using RFID tags to track individual cobbles. So this study started um, about three years ago. Where we collected about 350 cobbles off of Torrey Pines Beach and inserted small RFID tags um, in each one of the cobbles. And then we released them on the beach. And then we were to, able to track them with these various systems. So we developed a, a mobile system that we dragged around the beach with a, an ATV. Um, so this helped uh, to do relatively large scale mapping, but we also used a traditional handheld system, which looks a lot like a, um, a metal detector. And both of these systems actually ended up being important um, because the ATV can't drive in, in all the different places, whereas the, the handheld system can get in some of those nooks and crannies that the ATV cannot. Um, some of the other things we did uh, coincident with this, with the cobble tracking was um, mapping the beach topography and the offshore bathymetry, uh, doing photogrammetric drone surveys. We had video running. 
Um, we also had pressure sensors buried in the back of the beach. So we have a very uh, rich data set uh, to understand how cobbles are, are influencing um, the beach in this particular area. So this is the main study area um, that we had is about a 600 meter stretch of coastline a little bit south of Los Penasquillas Lagoon. Um, we released the cobbles in two different deployments. Um, the first deployment, we released about 200 cobbles in the middle of the beach in two different patches. Those are the red boxes here. And then the second deployment was about a month later. And those were about 150 cobbles and we released on an existing cobble berm in, in the back of the beach. Um, we then map the cobble uh, every day for the first 10 days and then weekly for a few weeks and then monthly up until now. Um, so we've been tracking these cobbles now for, for over uh, three years. So I'm gonna show you a little animation of, of what the cobbles did um, during the first year. So on the left-hand side are, are the cobble positions. So this is the first deployment, the two patches that we have in the middle of the beach. And then you'll see um, the second deployment will be the blue cobbles that will appear on, on the back of the beach. On the right-hand side here is the corresponding wave height um, during the time period. So what I want to point out um, is that the cobbles are, are quite dynamic. Um, they can move in different directions um, at the same time. There was a, a trend of uh, generally southerly transport, but one of the important things to see is that um, uh, cobbles didn't tend to stay in the center of the beach. And when they moved towards the back of the beach, they did become relatively stable. Um, as shown here, they tend to get um, incorporated into the cobble berm and become relatively stable. So some of the main um, findings that we have from this research is that the initial release location influenced um, how the cobble moved and where it ended up. Uh, cobbles did not tend to stay in the middle of the beach very long. They moved to the lower beach. Um, sorry, they moved to, to the upper beach generally. And once they did, they did become relatively stable on and help build up these uh, back shore cobble berms and that the accommodation space ended up being very important. Um, the cobble berms tend to want to form in the back of the beach where there's able for them to accommodate. So if there's uh, something protruding off out in the shoreline, this is not the kind of place where uh, these are going to accumulate. Um, so this research was recently published in um, Journal of Geophysical Research, if you're interested for more information, or you can feel free to email me. Um, some of the future things we're doing with trying to understand the cobbles is we have a continuously running um, automated monitoring station where we're monitoring the evolution of the cobble berm in the back of the beach. Um, we're also uh, digging holes in the berm to understand what's happening underneath. So uh, these berms typically consist of, of different layers. So there's a top layer that's pure cobble, and there's a bottom layer that's a mixed and sand cobble layer. And these are, are the sand is, is actually moving over time inside. And so we're trying to understand um, how these how this is uh, affecting the, the cobble berm stability. So in summary, I talked about some of the, the pros and cons of cobble, and particularly one of the things I think that's important to think about, um, particularly in, in populated areas, is the access issue um, that may be a negative impact for uh, using cobble. Um, I talked about um, the different methods and tracking um, techniques that, that we have and are using to um, make observations of the cobble and to discuss the sort of dynamics of the cobble and the stability and that the, um, the cobbles, again, in the middle and lower beach tend to be a lot less stable, but they do become uh, relatively stable when they form these large cobble berms in the back of the beach. And there's probably some sort of critical mass that, that is required to have these berms become relatively stable. 
Um, and so if you're going to start uh, using cobble for um, helping to develop natural shoreline protection methods, uh, placement of these cobbles is, is going to be um, very strategic. And just want to again thank um, Sea Grant for helping support this research, as well as uh, California State Parks and Army Corps, uh, as well as the many uh, field technicians and um, graduate students who helped uh, collect this data set. And I will happy to answer questions uh, after the next talk. Great, thank you so much, Adam. And I'll follow up on that um, with a reminder to keep adding questions to the Q&A or write them down and then we'll visit them after our next presentation. Uh, so our next presenter is Professor Ian Walker from UC Santa Barbara, who will be telling us about sea level rise and um, its effects on the longest barrier system in California. So with that, I'll pass it off to Ian to close out the presentation portion of this session or this panel. Thanks, Karina. Can everybody see my screen? The slides are showing okay? We can see them, but they're not in presenting mode. Okay. Is that better? Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, thanks everyone for your attention. Thanks for the invite. And I'll echo what uh, the previous presenters have said in terms of the, the value that Sea Grant and OPC have provided to really stimulating a lot of work across the state in so many different aspects to help with coastal resilience. Um, today, I'm just going to talk about one component of a broader project that was funded uh, by USCC Grant um, a whole bunch of players at the table here in terms of end users, collaborative partners and agencies, uh, graduate students, and so on and so forth. In particular, I'll thank Lara Shinsato, a master's student of mine, whose uh, master's thesis was essentially the vulnerability assessment that I'll share today, and Andrea Pickhart with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is one objective of, I think, seven in a, in a broader, broader project. So what I'll be speaking to today is the vulnerability assessment, so objective four of this project. For those of you who aren't familiar with the site, it's located in Northern California near Eureka and Arcata, and it uh, focuses on the shoreline of the Eureka littoral cell, which is one of the largest and one of the most active um, littoral cells in California. Um, so the goals of this component of the project were to basically conduct a vulnerability assessment. And our approach to that was um, not just biophysical, but broader human environmental vulnerabilities. So using existing frameworks for that and based on prior research in other sites, we came up with a comprehensive vulnerability methodology that we applied to the site. So just to make sure we're all on the same page as to what a coastal barrier is. It's essentially a, a landform that stretches parallel or along with the shoreline and, and separates the ocean from some landward wetlands, lagoons, or inlets. Um, and these barriers are quite common globally and are basically formed by the interaction of littoral sand supply delivered by waves to the beach. And in the case of the Humboldt barrier systems, the interaction of windblown sand with vegetation to create dunes on top of that barrier. So we call them a beach dune barrier in this case. Now the Humboldt Bays and Arcata Bays are actually formed by the presence of this barrier and have been present for thousands of years. And so much of the critical infrastructure in the region is protected by these natural barriers. And this is the, the largest barrier complex in California. Um, this site is also complicated uh, quite a bit by the tectonic setting. It's located just north of the Mendocino Triple Junction. And for those of you familiar with that, there are plates, three plates uh, moving in all different directions, which creates lots of earthquakes and lo lots of vertical motions of the Earth's crust. And of course, if your crust is moving up or down relative to the ocean and the ocean is rising, 
then we end up with what is a, a differential response of shoreline movement we call relative sea level rise. And so we wanted to assess that in particular at this site because of the dynamics offered by the tectonics. Um, when we, so this project is an extension of another project, uh, the Dunes Climate Ready Project that was funded, I think in 2015 through 2018, um, that has been gathering baseline information on coastal response and resilience since that time. And throughout our, our work over the past decade in Humboldt Bay, it was quite evident that many of the local planners and residents weren't aware of the risks and hazards and exposures at play here. And they weren't all aware either on what some of the options were for developing adaptation strategies and including things like restoring aspects of the function of the coastal barrier system. Okay. So the map, you're going to see a bunch of maps in this talk. Um, I'm a geographer by training, so that's kind of kind of what we do. Um, and they are at very um, high scale. So they're very high resolution maps. But of course, when we show the whole study site like this, it can be hard to see some aspects of it. I will zoom in, um, but you're looking at the barrier complex and the extent of the barrier on your left here. And we broke this into 13 different study reaches defined predominantly by their geomorphology and shoreline change rates. And then within each of those barriers, we have data sets um, that I'll talk about later that were used to aggregate and assess various vulnerabilities. So the map you're looking at here is a map at 100 meter pixel resolution of the um, future sea level inundation potential at these sites based on elevation relative to the mean monthly maximum water level derived over a 40 year average. So essentially by 2030, we're looking at an extra foot above that level. Now, these are based on the previous, or I guess current OPC um, 2018 guidance. And as Patrick said earlier, this is currently being updated. And I take his point well, in that we need to be using the most current information. And in some cases, these values uh, will change, so this will need to be updated. But all to say that using this uh, best information at the time, we plotted out where the risks would be associated with um, future sea level rise. Now, that's just one aspect here. So the table that you see on the right, you will also see throughout the presentation, and it shows different variables, um, 22 of them in total listed here grouped into different aspects of vulnerability. So largely geological and geomorphic um, that group up into physical vulnerabilities or exposures, um, biological aspects, natural hazards aspects that aggregate to a second order of vulnerability, so environmental um, vulnerabilities. And then we have various socioeconomic aspects down below. And when you roll these all up into the third level, this is what we mean by a comprehensive or human environmental um, vulnerability assessment. The method is fairly straightforward. Um, from a scientific perspective, this is not really advanced science. The method has been around for some time. We borrowed and updated from a prior method developed by the USGS. And that was intentional in that, you know, these methods have to be accessible. The data sets have to be understood and the method itself has to be something that, that people and managers can follow. Um, not to say that there weren't science objectives in behind this, but um, the point, the overarching point was to try and provide a method, results and, and data sets that were readily available and, and straightforward. Um, collecting this amount of data, and I, I took an earlier point to art as well, like this type of work, this uh, research to action and community-based research is incredibly time consuming. Um, I, I do a lot of field work uh, for, for my most of my research program, and uh, that I think that's time consuming. But then when you throw in door-to-door -door surveys and public workshops and so on and so forth, it becomes very, very time consuming, yet necessary. Um, I think we're at risk of missing a lot if we're not incorporating local knowledge into these, these perspectives. So the variables, just pulling together all of these variables was a challenge, but now we've created a resource for people in the region to continue to use and update those. 
Um, they were then converted all to either 100 meter pixels or 100 meter shore normal transects, depending on the variable, and then aggregated in terms of adding up the um, values for those one by one to create uh, vulnerability scores, which you'll see, which were normalized to zero to 10. Along the way, at several points during the project, we held local workshops, um, focus groups, and consulted with local experts to help refine both uh, the data sets and, and validate the data sets as well as the methods itself. And those public meetings and workshops are continuing. Okay, so what I'll be showing you now um, for a good portion of the talk are maps of both this scale. So this is the entire shoreline of the auriculatoral cell and the 13 study reaches and the different variables as they play out. So here we're looking at just one example of shoreline erosion and accretion. You'll see these are plotted as 100 meter transects, meaning that what's happening on the front of the barrier, we assume plays out or at least defines the vulnerability and exposure of the rest of the barrier and behind. So these were derived from historic air photo analysis using the USGS DSAS system, digital shoreline analysis system, and are colored by their rates of either retreat or uh, progradation. Um, you can see that it's highly variable as you would expect. Um, and these are not aggregated or averaged by reach. So these are at 100 meter resolution. So you can see in the tables again, that'll pop up here. This is just one of 22 variables. Here's another one relative sea level rise. So this was something that we created our own data set from using INSAR or satellite based uh, radar method to at the 100 meter pixel level determine how quickly the land was rising or falling um, using data sets that extended back into the 1980s. Now, remember, this is different than sea level rise, but contributes to either additively or um, negatively to relative sea level change. So the main thing you notice in this map here is the green areas are areas of relatively ro low relative. Oh, sorry, this is relative sea level. The um, vertical land motion map is uh, similar to this. So. What this map shows you is that the regions to the north are experiencing a slower rate of sea level rise. It's still positive than areas in the south. And essentially that's because the, the southern portion of the study area is experiencing subsidence due to its proximity to the Mendocino Triple Junction. Whereas the northern area is emerging because of plate uh, torque that's happening. So the rates of sea level rise are less in the north than they are in the south. So these are just two examples of variables that um, add up, if you like, to determine what we're calling the physical um, vulnerabilities. And so the map on the far left here shows you averaged by reach what the score is, if you like, of vulnerability just due to physical exposure of those variables. And I've just shown um, on the side here most of the variables you've seen these first two maps in the previous slide um, they, they have been used to comprise this and many of these variables are part of the usgs methodology some of them are the same throughout the region others are very uh, site specific so if we look at this map in greater detail and one of our intents was to provide a product there are vulnerability assessments that exist for the entire state uh, or not only the state but the entire united states um, but at a resolution that's interpretable and usable by local planners. So you can see these maps here are characterizing the physical vulnerability at 100 meter pixels with the ranked values here at a scale that a planner could say, okay, there's critical infrastructure in this stretch of pixels. We need to do something about that. Or in these locations, there is low vulnerability, at least in terms of physical exposures. Um, this is another grouping in our environmental. This is, these are the natural hazards exposures. What you're seeing here is the summary map of that. And it's comprised of, and I won't show all the variables here, but liquefaction hazard. Now that's not related, of course, to sea level rise at all, but it is another physical uh, exposure, geologic exposure and hazard that can influence the ability of an area to be resilient to high groundwater levels, as Patrick was discussing earlier, or coastal erosion and flooding. 
So compounded risks are something we also wanted to integrate in this vulnerability assessment. Some locations see more than one risk and there are uh, other metrics we can use to help characterize that. Coastal flooding, you can see on the, the left here um, based on the recent sea level rise guidance. So if you roll this up um, and look at it at high resolution, again, you can see areas that are, the warm colors are of higher natural hazards vulnerability and exposure and green are areas that are lower based on these four factors you see in the table here. Next, um, if we group all of those, so we looked at the physical and hazards. I didn't have time to show you the biological, but if we group them all into the environmental, this is what we see averaged by reach. So from a planning perspective, from com uh, community management um, and response, emergency response perspective, this has been quite useful um, to the local communities and that they can identify at a community scale areas that for various reasons are, are exposed or at risk. And the other thing we wanted to provide is a little resolution or granularity on, on why that is. So, for example, if we look at reach six here, um, there's a community present there. We're just looking at the environmental vulnerabilities. So. What this tells you is based on the subgroupings and the overall um, vulnerability, REACH 6, most of its vulnerability is associated with natural hazards and some biological concerns. So the presence of threatened and endangered species and valued land habitats and so on. And similarly, you could go to any other REACH and figure out why that environmental score is what it is. So that's the environmental side of things. I'll briefly show you the socioeconomic side of things here. This is a summary map. And um, here we've got sociocultural factors, including cultural sites of interest, population density, and land use. And these are the data behind those. So again, if you combine these data sets and average by reach, you end up with the map on the left. And this is just for sociocultural. Um, infrastructure is the other aspect to that. And so there are various aspects of coastal infrastructure that, and critical infrastructure that we worked in there. You can see some of them here, just two of them, population density. So the exposure of people based on how many live in certain areas on the barrier. It's not a very populated barrier, but there are areas uh, and communities on the barrier itself. Roads and transportation, emergency response services, and so on. Okay, so we, you get the idea here that we're using as much spatial data as we can to inform these various levels of vulnerability. So when we roll this up to socioeconomic vulnerability, as we did with the environmental, it's one thing to see the map and its, its general colors, that's helpful, but planners for Manila or the community of Samoa wanna know, well, why is it that we are socioeconomically vulnerable? So again, we can break down and, and we can actually go in, in much greater detail to the individual variables if, if they want. Um, if we look at REACH 6 again, the reason why it has such a high socioeconomic score is largely due to infrastructure exposures. There are businesses, factories, power plants, um, pipelines, and roadways in that location, plus a high population density. Hi, Ian, I'm just piping in with a gentle reminder that we're getting close to time. So we have time for our question, our Q and A session. Perfect. So what I would do here is walk up from one variable right through to comprehensive vulnerability. And just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll do that quickly. So these are in the guide on the bottom right here shows you where we're at in that walk up. So for planners, for landowners, for wildlife managers, for Caltrans and so on, these types of maps at this resolution with this aggregate approach to combining different types of exposures, risks, and vulnerabilities has been um, very informative and very helpful and is, is currently kind of feeding into their adaptation planning. So that with this tool, with these data sets, and this is being turned into a web-based uh, GIS system, um, any planner or any interested party would be able to go in and figure out why certain locations are vulnerable in certain ways. So in result, then we've, we've provided this tool um, with some uh, aggregation of existing data sets and some new research funded by uh, the Sea Grant program 
to provide a big picture perspective with high resolution detail to inform local planning and management. We've identified some areas of, of concern. This uh, methodology is transferable anywhere um, and you could adjust the weighting, you could adjust the types of variables according to the local setting and local knowledge that you might gather during that project. So I think with that, I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, have some time for questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ian. Thanks for all those gorgeous maps too. So we'll transition now into our Q and A. Um, again, feel free to keep adding them in the Q and A module button or raise your hand. Um, but while you're thinking of those or typing those out, I'll start with um, a moderator question, similar to what was asked in the first panel um, about best practices in research to application. You, you've all talked about it a bit in your presentations. Um, and we had um, some examples of the, for example, agencies that you've interacted with, like um, Caltrans was just mentioned. I think we've talked about the Coastal Commission, so on and so forth. Um, but if you had to give, you know, a quick, the best practices that you would recommend um, for other researchers to transfer their research into application, I'm curious what you would what you would say. And we can start, um, why don't we start with Ian, if that's okay? Sure, thanks. Yeah, so um, I think this is the third vulnerability assessment I've been involved in, and each has really benefited from that local knowledge. Um, and that's not easy to incorporate. And as Patrick said, I think one way to do that is to be in as many rooms as you can and have as many conversations and engagement uh, points, touch points from early on in the project. Um, the first vulnerability assessment I was involved in was was up north near Alaska in an island group, which had a, a very strong active First Nations culture that was often at odds with the local communities, the local fishers, and not engaging them early enough almost compromised the, the project and not being aware of the tensions and the sensitivities um, which we were, but, you know, I, I think being aware and being present and, and planning ahead and engaging locally is, is key. And that's, I think Patrick said this too, or maybe Adam, we're not trained to do that, <laughs> but we need to be doing that. And I am very encouraged to see that there are programs out there now supporting research to action and end user engagement, like these projects have been. Yeah, absolutely. Early and often is, is I think, the key. And um, it's great to see, like you said, just how many partners are involved in these projects for all the different elements, all the different phases of that, um, that information transfer, both from local knowledge, but also from the scientists back. Um, Adam, I'm curious if you have anything, any thoughts on this question? Yeah, I feel like um, a lot of this has already been said, but definitely you know, engaging with the stakeholders is really important, um, particularly, I think, understanding their needs, which oftentimes, as a, may have, as a scientist, you may not be thinking about what they actually need, or the coastal managers might actually want. Um, and then some of the, I, one thing that's probably maybe unique to some of the field work that we do is, um, that I think is important is engaging people in the field. We often get uh, people stopping by asking questions and it's actually, oftentimes we're in a time constraint because we're working on you know a title situation. And so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll just bring an extra person with us to help answer questions so we can continue our work. But I find that people, um, you know, once they understand what we're doing, they, they're often very supportive and, um, and curious and it's a good, way to do local outreach as well and get people to, um, you know, be interested in the project. And, um, you know, it's particularly like when, uh, you know, for planning purposes for new projects, um, permitting those types of things is getting the public um, support is, I find has been particularly important in, in a lot of our projects. Awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, working on the beach, it's a public space that a lot of people feel very close to. And so I think that's really, I, I hadn't heard of that strategy of bringing someone to be able to field those questions and, and um, engage people in that way. That's awesome. Um, Patrick, I know you had a whole 
list of best practices, but I want to also give you an opportunity if anything, you want to reiterate anything or anything new comes to mind. Let's see. I mean, Ian and Adam touched on a lot of great things for sure. Um, you know, for us, I think, you know, networking is crucial. Um, as a postdoc, I, I went, I was going to community meetings in San Francisco to try to figure out what's really going on. And and I think the first meeting I went to, I met um, Leslie Ewing, Coastal Commission, and Tom Kendall, Army Corps of Engineers, and you know, they become lifelong colleagues. And so I think you can't underscore the importance of getting out there in the field, talking to people, talking to communities, talking to agency people, and it opens up a whole new world of what science can actually be. So I think that's huge. And the other aspect is just leaning on these boundary organizations. You know, at this point, I should be calling Phyllis Auntie Phyllis because she's just been so instrumental in guiding us through the complicated, you know, political framework of California in general and, and early on the city of LA, which would have been impossible for a scientist to sort out and who to talk to, when to talk to them, when to release a report, when not to release a report. I mean, there's so much expertise across the state and these people are all hugely approachable. They love what they do and they're an incredible resource for students and scientists alike to, to interface with and to get guidance from. And they, everybody wants to help. And so I think that goes for myself too. You know, we try to have open door policy with basically anyone in the state, you know, whether it's a student, whether it's someone in an agency, whatever, to to try and support folks. And it's it's a community that's really supportive of each other. And so it's a great place to to be doing science and to hopefully turn that into policy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I see we have one question in the chat, um, actually from Phyllis, and this is directed at Adam. Phyllis asks, how much can you extrapolate your results to other locations? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I think that we need more observations of, of this of, of this type of thing to be able to extrapolate. I do think the, you know, the techniques are definitely applicable to other locations, um, but oftentimes in coastal environments, yeah, it, there can be other variables uh, that are important that may not be in a different location. So I think it would be very interesting to to look at some other um, areas and, and see how the cobbles behave. But in general, I think, um, there's definitely probably a result that may be generally applicable, but we probably want to test them out. Yeah. Gotcha. Great. Um, well, I see that we're actually at time now, um, and I don't want to cut our next panel short. So I'll pause us there, but if there are any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we can try to come to those, um, you know, after this workshop um, it, or you can get in contact with us. So I wanna thank our three panelists again so much. Thank you, Adam, Patrick, and Ian for excellent presentations. And um, looking forward now to our last panel. So I'll pass it off to Amalia to introduce and moderate our last panel of the day. All right, thank you again to our uh, two panels and all the panelists within. Uh, just really appreciate the depth you were able to convey in 15 minutes is a tall challenge. So thank you for sharing your research with us, sharing your best practices with us. And we're now going to turn to our last panel of the day, um, which is a really exciting panel talking about best practices for bringing research to application. We've heard a little bit about that from our researchers already, some really helpful perspectives on that. Um, now we're gonna have a panel of experts who are also really passionate about bringing research to bear on real world challenges in our urban ocean. Um, our panelists either fund, facilitate, or leverage applied research in the work that they do. And we'll have Caitlin Kalua from Depu our Deputy Director at the Ocean Protection Council, Dr. Wesley Smith, Senior Environmental Toxicologist with OEHA and Cal EPA. Dr. Douglas George with the National National Estuarine Research Reserve System, Science Collaborative Program Manager, um, and this is from NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. And finally, Dr. Megan Hall, who is a Senior Environmental Scientist and Mitigation Specialist with California Coastal Commission. So I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin, and I'll be advancing slides for you, Caitlin. So just let me know um, when to advance. Perfect. Thank you, Amalia. And thanks all. We're getting to the final hour. So this is exciting. The next, perfect. You're on the next slide. Thank you, Amalia. 
Um, just taking a step back, this slide deck will be pretty broad, broad brushes, knowing that we have different applications, different agency perspectives, but just a general um, initial insight on best practices for that research management um, application, given OPC is a funding agency within the state of California. And again, back to our mission that I shared at the beginning of this workshop, is to protect California's coast and ocean by advancing innovative uh, science-based policy, but also ensuring that our decisions are made by with the best available science um, and catalyzing action you know, through, through partnerships. We don't do this alone. And so just by way of background, our strategic goals generally fall under these four categories of climate change, equity, biodiversity, and a sustainable blue economy, looking at emerging ocean uses um, off the coast of California. And of course, many of these are integrated. Um, next slide, please. Just an initial kind of um, thoughts, especially some really wonderful ta tangible recommendations that came out of the panels today. Um, I'll share from OPC's perspective when crafting a research proposal, crafting a concept, um, just to provide context that at OPC, our research needs are often informed through multi-agency collaboration. It's identifying barriers or information needs that are specific to individual programs or regulatory requirements. Um, and so this is where in preparing competitive solicitations or pro competitive proposals is explicitly tying your research object objectives, the deliverables to existing strategic priorities or identified um, plans or needs on a local state it could be federal level. Um, for example, national marine sanctuaries often maintain strategic plans. Um, and it's not only tying it to that strategic plan objective, but how, articulating how that research outcome or the deliverable will actually be then tangibly used to advance um, those objectives. So I cannot stress that enough. It cannot be an afterthought that is part of the co um, the planning of, of, I think, a sound research program in, in a large way. Uh, so thinking about, is the question you're seeking to answer actionable? How does it actually advance not only the understanding, but of course, how it will be used? What is the tool or analysis that's needed on that topic? Um, and what will then result from your project? How will the data importantly be integrated into existing databases and government tools, or is it creating a new tool? Uh, what ways will your final product provide guidance or inform that agency action? So those are things to think about when explicitly tying then to those agency uh, strategic plans or um, existing reports and, and planning documents on the local level which then comes down to that early and often engagement theme that has been shared throughout this afternoon. Uh, with that to then inform the actual application is then, are, if you're developing a tool, a model, have you engaged with agencies to discuss that end use? Um, are you discussing timing, the timing needs related to that data? Um, what are the timing drivers for individual agencies? Uh, what are the deadlines that they're working against? Um, Onto the second bullet, just very briefly. For OPC, we have a, a science advisory team that's convened by the Ocean Science Trust, it's actually directed through statute to serve as a venue between decision makers and scientists to come together and discuss uh, priority issues and advise the state on how best to move forward. This often takes place with specific task, task forces. Um, our sea level rise guidance that was our draft 2024 update was just released last Friday that was convened through a specific task force uh, facilitated through the Ocean Science Trust and is now going through public comment. But I wanna flag those workshops, those task forces as an opportunity um, to be either become engaged or to look at the result, resulting reports, resulting documents that often identify where are information gaps, information needs um, and thinking about how your research may or may not fit in to those identified research needs. Uh, the California Sea uh, Grant Program, as well as USCC Grant, um, had a wonderful workshop last summer on a deep ocean DDT research needs, which then had a workshop, a subsequent report that is now guiding both state and federal uh, research investments related to DDT. So again, plugging into where are these uh, culminating workshops, these task forces, what are the final products that regardless if you are physically on the task force are still applicable to your research. Additionally, as just reiterating what we heard this afternoon is considering partnerships, you know, be between PIs, departments, academic institutions, who are your external partners, um, which 
my final remarks, I'm going to go through a couple of slides, uh, keeping an eye on time that will have some best practices as far as how to engage the community and, or external partners in your research. And excuse me, um, one piece for encouraging um, Research solicitations from OPC, our partners within Sea Grant are often encouraging awards for early career um, scientists, essentially having competitive solicitations that are encouraging partnerships between established and experienced PIs to include early career researchers. So again, it's building in a pipeline of that knowledge transfer within um, science research, research sciences itself. And finally, back to the data and use of, the, of your research is, um, understanding that federal and state funding sources often have data sharing and submission requirements, that data must be public, if it's publicly funded, um, must be made publicly available at no or little cost. But beyond those requirements, thinking through how data and findings will be presented during the lifetime of your project. Again, as you're developing a proposal in the early stages, even before an RFP is initiated, is understanding where the timing needs of, the, of an agency that is a potential um, recipient or end user of your research within your field. What are the timelines that they're working against? So it, uh, what are the critical points where a preliminary presentation on preliminary findings is appropriate to provide a briefing either with an agency, an external stakeholder, and a public forum? DPT research is a great example where there are now community forums being held on about a semi-annual basis, reporting out the research findings in a public forum, as well as under, looking at the uh, data submission uh, requirements or how your data will be submitted to existing portals or new portals. For example, the State Water Board um, data repository is seed in. It's for all water quality, water quality data that is then integrated into the integrated report and assessment of water quality and state waters of California. So again, where are the tools? How's your data going to be publicly shared? As well as just a general suggestion to share drafts of submitted manuscripts when they are submitted um, with a funding agency or if you're comfortable with external partners. I know that can be sensitive if, it, if it's not yet peer reviewed, but it's part of that presenting the preliminary findings. So that way, if you have someone who intends to use this data or apply it, they know it's coming down the pipeline. It's not a surprise and you know, having that four to six to potentially nine month delay before something's actually submitted. Next slide, please. Wrapping up remarks, I'll go through these next ones fairly quickly. Uh, just as a resource, um, OPC does encourage its applicants to review our recently adopted um, equity plan. This was adopted in 2022 that has specific strategies that include our commitment to budgeting for and identifying community engagement opportunities as appropriate within our funding um, proposals or our competitive solicitations and ensuring again that research or projects, if it's a built construction project, are informed by local community needs and engagement. And so it does have a couple of these commitments. I would recommend looking under goals, uh, goal one, strategy 1.4.2, as well as uh, goal four, which outlines some of these commitments of OPC in our funded work. Next slide, please. Additionally, OPC adopted its first ever tribal engagement strategy last year. It's a framework for enhancing communication and partnerships between OPC and California Native American tribes. This is specific to a formal agency, for example, a formal consultation to consultation, but other mechanisms for communication that could have application beyond a formal government setting. Uh, we do recognize that effective, meaningful engagement and partnership with tribes and tribal communities is evolving and we are in the process of developing guidance for prospective and current grantees, but this is a good starting point and resource. Next, next slide, please, one minute warning. The next slide is just an example of how our competitive solicitations are increasingly including community engagement, Deja diversity inclusion um, principles into, the, into proposals. So thinking through not only is this a checkpoint or checkbox within a proposal, but how is, diversity, equity, inclusion, or community engagement, if it's applicable, embedded in the research design. So this include guided research and mentorship opportunities. It can be um, engaging with communities and showing those, um, those reporting out and decision points through a proposal, or it's maybe incorporating a community in a study design. Maybe there are participants physically in the study. Next slide, please. Thank you. A slide that I'll just leave it, uh, the next one. Thank you, that's perfect. 
just taking away as a resource for those on this panel is an example of what we've seen in successful proposals. These are only initial examples, of course, but again, each of uh, these concepts were, whether it be community um, engagement, education, citizen science, uh, partnerships with tribes, is that the proposals had thoughtfully designed and embedded uh, these principles and components of the research into the full research um, project and proposal. Next slide. Lastly, there are principles of community engagement, a number of resources that exist within agencies to help inform uh, your community engagement, whether in the research context, in the government context, um, and understanding that this is an initial starting point. But for, uh, excuse me, uh, I think the big key takeaway is that meaningful engagement of managing expectations. Do you have a mechanism of reporting out partway through your research to solicit feedback, to answer inquiries? And do you have a mechanism at the end to essentially summarize any feedback that was received with external partners, whether it be agency, the members of the public, that shows that these th that feedback and inquiries were otherwise incorporated and addressed through your research. Final slide, please. Just to share, so our OPC listserv to stay informed, um, stay in contact with us. It looks like there may have been a formatting issue with with a with our sub subscription list. I can drop that in the chat after this. But just in closing, want to share kind of the key takeaways for application to research. The con conceptual of designing proposals is um, that direct, explicit application to agency reports, local plans, et cetera, making that uh, clear and distinct connection. Second is communi communicating preliminary findings with affected agencies or other end users. Third is understanding the regulatory and policy structure within in which your research fits. So you understand the timing or regulatory um, limitations or information needs within that system. And fourth is that early and thoughtful community engagement and inclusion in the research design. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was such a rich um, 10 minutes. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us about how OPC is approaching this, um, the recommendations you've seen and put forth based on successful projects. Thank you. All right, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Wesley Smith. Thank you, Amalia. Uh, let me share my screen here. been a great presentation. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. And uh, my name is Wes Smith. I work at the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, on, which is under the banner of California EPA. And some of my comments might be, I might sound like, slightly like a broken record, repeating some of the things that uh, Caitlin just talked about, but hopefully coming from a different angle. Um, OEHA is the lead state agency uh, for the assessment of health risks posed by environmental contaminants. We develop health protective guidance values, which are generally non-regulatory and that support uh, standards in air, water, soil, and other media, which are generally regulatory. We also provide toxicological expertise. OEHA is probably about 50% toxicologists. So outside of the federal government, we're one of the strongest um, concentrations of toxicologists out there uh, to inform regulatory and public health decisions, both by uh, California EPA boards and departments and other state agencies, um, such as the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I was on the phone with the Office of Spill Prevention Response this week, past weekend, working on some oil spills. And we also promote the use of scientific knowledge and data to better understand uh, potential risks related to exposure to toxic substances. And over to the right is just a collage of some of the programs at OEHA. We uh, kind of have our fingers on a widespread of uh, different areas such as Cal Enviro Screen, Proposition 65, which I'm sure many people have seen those warnings air toxic hotspots program, um, indicators of climate change in California, biomonitoring California, uh, providing information to healthcare workers in regard to pesticide exposure, uh, fish advisory fact sheets and advisories. I just have three broad topics that um, 
I wanted to present some of the things that we have going on at OEHA. One being our fish consumption advisories. I'm sure many people are well aware of the, uh, the advisory down in Southern California, but we have uh, general information. We have four statewide advisories, and this is just an image of our landing page. We have a fish advisory map as well as a short video on how to use the fish advisories. And just to provide an example of what our fish advisory uh, graphical communication uh, products look like, this is uh, our fish advisory for Santa Monica Beach or Santa Monica Pier down the Seal Beach Pier, otherwise known as the Red Zone. These are some of the highest, our areas highest in uh, at least fish species, highest in DDTs and PCBs of particular interest to uh, the DDT workshop coming up later this week. And this is a range of our current fish consumption advisories. So we have sort of our longstanding advisories, which show the risk drivers, which is the chemical contaminant that results in the lowest amount of uh, consumption for each species. And more than one dry, you can see that these do not add up to 100%. And that's because we consider multiple drivers when we're looking at developing consumption advice, specifically mercury, PCBs, and DDTs. We currently have about 145 uh, site-specific advisories. And on the right is showing um, the locations of those advisories on a geographic scale. And moving away from fish, we have some other programs such as Cal Enviro Screen, which is uh, an environmental justice screening tool that is developed and um, constantly improved upon at OEHA. And some of you may be familiar with this. It provides uh, data and mapping tools to look at a range of indicators to look at uh, disproportionate burdens upon certain communities based on both sociodemographic factors as well as uh, environmental exposure. So this can be a, a really useful tool as uh, people are considering developing proposals and how that might uh, impact environmental justice concerns. We also produce the indicators of climate change in California report. Uh, this most recent report from 2022 looked at 41 indicators and reports from eight tribes. And I know Patrick uh, was a contributor to this report. So this is prepared by OEHA in uh, collaboration with state and federal agencies, academic and research institutions. And most recently, one of the most exciting things incorporated is input from California tribes. So we have a, a range of sponsored events. Um, this one taking place earlier this month is very uh, much in OEHA's wheelhouse as it's looking at new approach methodologies for decision making and toxicokinetics. So this may not appeal to a broad swath of the audience, but for very specific uh, types of research, this can be really useful. And this are things we think about often. But on a broader scale, we have uh, the Indicators of Climate Change Symposium happening this uh, Wednesday. And I know Caitlin, I believe, will be presenting at that. And that is taking place from 9 to 5 at the California EPA building up the street from the Natural Resources building. So it's looking at new science and down the ways that climate change is impacting California. So this is kind of a it's both the indicators as well as a story and a narrative of how climate change is affecting a variety of California's populations. So it's also integrating diverse knowledge and perspectives to um, better understand climate risks and work toward equitable, sustainable solutions. And also, like Caitlin mentioned, interagency work groups are a great a uh, resource for people to get involved and get a sense of the landscape of different programs. And one of the work groups that we're heavily involved with is the Safe to Eat work group that is sponsored by the State Water Board under the SWAMP or Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program and under SWAMP, the Bioaccumulation Monitoring Program. This group used to be known as BOG or the 
uh, bioaccumulation oversight group, but has undergone a, a name change to the safe to eat work group. It's a little more uh, friendly for the public. And there's a lot of different players in this, such as the San Francisco Estuary Institute, uh, Moss Landing Labs does a lot of the coordination for uh, collection of fish samples and coordinating analysis. We've been including California Native American tribes and tribal organizations. We are currently developing a uh, tribal bi bioaccumulation training series, which should be exciting. Other uh, water quality council work groups across the state, uh, a variety of regional monitoring programs, such as the Bay RMP, Delta RMP, the Bite RMP. We also work with uh, US EPA on a range of topics and also CDPH and Biomonitoring California, looking at uh, people's exposure to chemicals through consumption. And this is our logo here with the other state public health agency, uh, Department of Public Health. And there's also the, the HAB related illness tracking work group. And this is a closed work group, but we coordinate with uh, Department of Public Health, Water Board, and California Department of, Department of Fish and Wildlife to get information regarding potential illnesses related to harmful algal blooms and load those up, submit those to the CDC One Health Harmful Algal Bloom Database. And also related to this is the CC HAB group, which is a public group that uh, I should have included a slide with the information, but some folks I know here, such as Jamie, are well uh, informed on those areas. And so that was a, a very brief and quick overview of our projects. Uh, I'm happy to be a point person for contacts within a WEHA or any of these work groups. You can contact me here at my email or you can go to the OEHA website for more information. And with that, I'll take any questions at the end, I suppose. Thanks so much, Wes. Yes, if you have questions, please put in the Q&A or the chat. I'll also kind of have a moment for people to raise their hands if they prefer to ask verbally. Um, thanks so much, Wes. Really helpful to see what OE has up to, where there's opportunities for people to learn about state priorities, to be engaged in these interagency working groups, which um, has come up as a theme, as a helpful way to inform priorities and um, hear about state priorities. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker, Dr. Douglas George. Okay. <clears throat> All right, does it looking good? It's loading. Good. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I should start out by saying I don't know if it's the 49ers game, but my voice left the building on Sunday. So I'm just gonna growl through this. I apologize for all your ears. Um, I'm gonna put them through. <clears throat> Anyway, um, so yeah, thank you so much for including Noah in this uh, really important workshop talking about research to application. Uh, my name is Doug George. I'm the program manager for the NERS, the National Estuarine Research Reserve System uh, Science Collaborative Program. And I'm gonna be talking to you about our collaborative science uh, mindset, principles, and the guide that we have produced to, uh, to help in a lot of all the activities that we've talked about today. <clears throat> uh, just a, a really brief introduction to the NERS system. Uh, for those of you not familiar with it, it's a, a network of 30 reserves across the country and into Puerto Rico. And um, we partner with our university or state partner to with NOAA to operate these place-based marine protected areas that are um, in the estuarine region, in the estuarine zones. Uh, we have lots of partners we work with. That's the spirit of NOAA and Office for Coastal Management where the program uh, resides. And today we have about one, a little under 1.3 million acres protected. Uh, we are bringing Louisiana online and that's gonna go over 2 million acres protected. And, and so we continue to grow. Here in California, we are one of the states because of our size that we have three uh, NERS. <clears throat> 
uh, San Francisco Bay, Elkhorn Slough, and then in the Southern California Bite, uh, the Tijuana River Estuary, which this is a picture um, looking across the, the mirror there in Tijuana uh, Estuary. The program that um, that we have within the NERS, the, the Prado program, the Science Collaborative, it's our research um, program. It's our science program that we um, we create a funding uh, mechanism to support collaborative science um, specifically. <clears throat> I have some of the mechanics about the program up here on the screen. Um, it's you know, our cooperative between um, NOAA and a host. So that's why you see University of Michigan as one of my co-authors on this uh, at the beginning of the slide. But it, the key is, re, is supporting the reserves management needs. Our current priority areas um, are there in that green bubble. Uh, you know, wouldn't be much of a surprise to this community um, about what, we, what we're investing in. But um, one of the things I wanted to point out early here, um, and I think Amalia has some links that we're gonna put in the chat um, to a few different items. But tomorrow, uh, one of the things we do is we host a monthly webinar series about collaborative science. And tomorrow we have a, um, a session about getting to the meaning of meaningful engagement. So if you can join us, please do. And uh, that will be that will be great. But what I want to focus on <clears throat> is the management needs. And you're going to see my little hot tips throughout, the, throughout my presentation. Uh, so every year I contact all 30 reserves and I request them to send me their management needs. Uh, and those management needs must fit into our, our broader priorities for the whole program that runs for those five years. So I collect those needs, I bucket them, and then we produce them as part of our RFPs that go out. So a key part, which we've heard from a few different speakers of collaborative science is being responsive to management needs and bringing those management needs in um, on a frequent enough basis for your particular spot you're managing is, um, is my first hot tip. Um, as I'm focusing a lot in the program is called collaborative science. Um, it's more than just putting two words together. There is, there is a, a definition to the concept of collaborative science, but some of the basics um, that we've already touched on some of the speakers, just kind of wrap this up a little bit higher. Um, certainly starting with a management or a policy challenge and bringing together in a formal structure, uh, researchers, uh, the project locale, <clears throat> users of output and collaborative leads individually cannot accomplish what together all of them can. And so that co-creation process is designed to be inclusive and recognizing that, um, that each one of these partners in the process will, will provide different strengths and then produce products, data information that are designed for informing those decisions. Um, you know, many of us, myself included, we can raise hands. How many of us have written a report and it sat on a shelf or a PDF file somewhere? Um, that is absolutely not what we're trying to accomplish when we're funding projects throughout the country uh, through this program. Does it work? Well, I think so. Um, it worked. We can ask the Tijuana River NER what they've been up to. Um, I'm not going to read through all of the slide. These are just examples of projects that the Science Collaborative um, awarded through the competitive funding process. The only one I'm going to mention is that very first one, uh, which is CURVE, the climate, under, uh, climate Understanding and Resilience in the River Valley. And that's this has been a springboard for more than a decade of, um, of continued projects, subsequent projects, but it's not necessarily projects that, are, that have been the, um, the key component of what's come out of this. It's been the relationships that have been built and sustained and new agencies coming together and having conversations that may have been harder um, and also building the trust so that when new hard conversations come, there's already a relationship to rely on. Um, I guess what I wanted to show you too is just the breadth of project types that we that we do fund, including marine debris work, water quality work, and blue carbon um, work within tidal, um, tidal zone, the estuarine zone. I also want to point out, um, since Patrick was here, um, I got to go back in the way back machine, and the Science Collaborative was one of the first funders of OCOF uh, way back uh, more than 
12 years ago, 15 years ago now. And um, so it's really exciting to see little seed money that we as a community have continued to use um, and, and progressed from the Science Collaborative. <clears throat> so just to turn a little bit away from the program itself uh, to get to our mindset and principles, uh, we have 30 reserves and we have infinite knowledge systems. And these systems, um, we're, I'm kind of representing them here from institutional knowledge, which we're very familiar with, but indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge, community knowledge, landscape level knowledge, all of these complexities that we could never simply capture from an institutional perspective. So we were starting to articulate something around this and, and then our world changed quite significantly. And so we felt that it was time to respond to, um, to changing needs and changing perspectives uh, and describe how the Science Collaborative thinks about collaborative science and about the principles that we want our project teams to embrace. So I'm definitely not gonna read this slide, but um, there is a QR code here. Uh, if you want a QR code, the links are in the chat where you can go and start to understand more about um, the mindset and principles. So this is the mindset that we, we want teams to approach the projects so that we are successful. And I'm just gonna highlight the th three big blocks here. The first one is building reciprocal relationships, understanding that extractive science is not going to lead to long-term relationships. And um, that building that reciprocation back and forth is what will continue work well after the project money has run out. The second part is about thoughtful orientation. And this is recognizing, um, great, that's perfect. Um, that's recognizing the, uh, the strengths of everyone who's coming to the table. And the third around trust, building the trust that um, through the transparency and competency so that we can continue to work together. The principles here are um, what build off of this. So it's great to have a concept that we make put it into practice. So our science collaborative projects, which are not going to be um, similar, identical ever, um, is embracing these four components. Responding to that management need defined by the socio-ecological system, engaging with the users and building those reciprocal relationships, tailoring the processes to context and creating relevant and usable products. So to get a little help to do that, uh, we have a lot of information that we have gathered and put together a guide. And so let me just step through, I'm not gonna read things, this is just really an introduction to the guide for you to, um, to go and examine, but we have templates, we have case studies, we have um, guidance on how to do all of these different steps within a science collaborative process. So while you're scoping your project, understand the management need, getting to know your intended users, not the end users, we've moved away from that language um, because science continues after, after the money's out. And then defining your purpose, designing your project. Um, who's gonna be involved? What are the barriers to their involvement? Is it childcare? Is it hours? Is it physical? Is it geography? Understanding how to work around those barriers so you have a very representative team. Enhancing your collaboration. Um, this is a little bit of project management stuff here, um, but key in this is understanding that there might be challenges and conflicts that you're going to have to anticipate. Um, how do you proactively manage ahead of that? And then finally, fine tuning those products. Um, we've seen a few great examples today of products that are tuned to the question and, and who is using the information. <clears throat> so this is where we have examples of maybe it's art, Maybe it's a story map. Maybe it's um, a policy paper. It depends on your question, what you need to create. And as I said, we have a lot of case studies in the guide and examples um, that would that can give you an accessible point anywhere throughout your process. Um, if you're at the beginning, if you're halfway, halfway through a project and you're struggling a little bit, we have, we have an answer for you. So last, um, my last slide, um, just summarizing that, smoothing that road along the roadway from research to, uh, to application, um, really embracing those principles and mindset around what collaborative science is, is, is a great first step. 
gathering those management needs frequently enough. You know, for us, we do it annually. For you, your place might be every other year, like every six months. Who knows what you're doing? Um, and then we have a lot of resources available uh, for anybody. And that other QR code, this is a different one, it'll take you to right to the guide where we have a video and you can be introduced a little bit more um, about what we have to offer. So I'm looking forward to our conversation afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doug. Really appreciated the scales you walked us through from mindset to principles to even logistics to outreach. Thank you so much. All right, and our final speaker for today is Dr. Megan Hall. Hello, hi everyone. Um, I'm just gonna take a minute to share my screen. All right, are you seeing it in presenter view? Perfect. Okay. Second view. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, last talk of the day. I will try to be brief and I will say it was good to hear. Uh, many of the same things that I am going to highlight here have already been mentioned, um, but hopefully I can also share them from a slightly different perspective. Um, thank you to USC Sea Grant for organizing this and for inviting me. And thanks to all of you for being here and for sticking around. And so I'm going to be sharing my perspective on best practices as current staff at the California Coastal Commission. Um, and some of my comments will be informed also by my experience working for the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Before that, hence the general coastal management uh, title. Um, and I also just wanted to highlight that uh, both of these agencies do lots of work that's focused on natural science and ecology, as well as um, much more social science elements like environmental justice and public access and whatnot. My background is more on the natural science side, and so the talk is going to skew a little bit that way, but um, I think some of the principles could still apply across types of research. Um, into the social sciences as well. So first, a brief intro to the Coastal Commission, um, and this generally applies to BCDC as well as a regulatory coastal management agency. These agencies permit development and other activities in California's coastal zone. And um, in general, they're reviewing projects for issues that include natural resource impacts, public access, environmental justice, hazards, and the list goes on. That's just um, some of the really big ones that we're considering when reviewing projects. Um, and, you know, then essentially staff are recommending project approval or approval with conditions, um, or in some cases denial to a voting body, which would be the commission. And while that seems like a very reactive process. Um, at, on the back end, there's actually a lot of work that happens up front, coordinating with applicants to ensure that projects that are being proposed um, have the greatest chance of complying with the Coastal Act and uh, getting through review. So uh, how do agencies like the Coastal Commission use science, or in other words, what is the application of science uh, for agencies like the Commission? So coastal management agencies, coastal management regulatory agencies rely heavily on science to objectively implement our laws and policies and to also keep laws, policies, and practices up to date. So I mentioned that at the core of the agency function, staff are reviewing projects to ensure consistency with laws and policies. Um, and that review has to also be informed by the best available science, whether that's new research or existing uh, scientific best practice. Um, take for example, a wetland resilience project or a project proposing to upscale a culvert to improve wildlife connectivity. In cases like these, staff would ask whether the project design considers the best available science. Um, staff may try to consider novel environmental impacts based on new research findings. And finally, uh, we'll consider the best available science in analyzing any proposed mitigation measures. 
Um, and additionally, as new science comes out, staff uh, and higher ups at the agency essentially will need to um, ensure that projects are evaluated or to ensure that the policies and the laws of the agencies are being updated to reflect the best available science and our current understanding of the system. Um, and so essentially science can have a huge impact on how these agencies do business and what projects are actually able to go forward or not. Um, and ultimately then what the, the footprint of development and or lack thereof looks like along the coast. Um, and so getting to the point of today's conversation, how do managers actually get that science? And the three main points I'm going to touch on are things that we have heard many times already today. Um, but just to reiterate, um, really, that you know, from my perspective, I saw kind of these three big uh, tasks or ways of going about communicating research. First, getting familiar with the issues and building connections. Second, involving agencies in funding review, research question development, and research planning. And third, sharing results in a direct and accessible way. And so I'll speak a little more on each of these in a minute, but I wanted to note that while these best practices are directed toward researchers and funders, um, it's definitely a two-way street and agency staff also have to engage. It's really critical to have um, technical staff at agencies like the role that I sit in to help to sort of play that liaison role in between uh, analysts who are looking at a whole suite of issues and some of the really targeted issues on, say, ecology or coastal hazards. Um, and in addition, while I'm not going to get into the details of this today, too, um, I think it's also just really important that there are so many other players involved in connecting the dots here, and we've heard a little bit about that today. Um, organizations like Sea Grant and OPC, as well as boundary organizations like SWERP and SFC, SFEI, um, even environmental consultants are really critical players in getting science uh, into actual practice uh, for these for the kinds of projects that the Coastal Commission is viewing, or for our law and policy changes, um, and also really importantly, stakeholders and members of the public. We have a really strong public process, and um, a lot of times the public highlights really critical new science to agency staff and to the commissioners, and I think that's really critical as well. Um, and another caveat of these suggestions is that there are definitely different degrees and different types of applied science, ranging from science on relevant issues that could be useful to managers to research that's carried out to develop a specific product for a specific end user. I think we saw a little bit of all of those today. Um, and depending on where your research falls along that applied science spectrum, there may be different degrees to which any of these suggestions um, is as directly applicable or necessary. So for example, if you're already familiar with the issues and know everyone super well, then uh, keep doing it, that's awesome. But I think that you know, uh, starting on that path isn't as necessary for you because you're already halfway there. Okay, um, so getting into these actual best practices. First, um, getting familiar with the issues and building connections. It is so critical to know your audience and know the types of issues where they are finding research needs and gaps. So, for example, if the commission um, is a potential agency that would be an end user for you, something like attending um, public meetings, which we have monthly, uh, you could attend commission meetings, review the commission's strategic plan. Uh, those are great ways to get informed on the kinds of challenges that we're dealing with day to day and are actively reviewing in project review and policy updates. Um, also attending or hosting in the case of entities like Sea Grant or um, even some of the academic partners, attending or hosting conferences, workshops, or symposia that are intended to allow for those opportunities to cross pollinate and let the research community and um, agency manager staff get familiar with each other and the types of issues that each other are working on. Um, and additionally, 
really just reaching out. I think potentially uh, Patrick Bernard was the one who mentioned this before, but just direct contact um, with folks who who you're familiar with that might be uh, useful end users. I think that's totally acceptable to just email and um, try to set up a time to, to do an information exchange and get familiar with the types of issues that agencies are dealing with. Um, next, involving agencies in research funding and decisions. This is particularly important if you're conducting research with a set of end users in mind. The more you can directly communicate with agency end users as you're developing research questions and making fund deci funding decisions, um, the more likely that the products will actually be usable and comport with how those agencies do business. Um, and so you could co-develop research projects with agencies, um, attend, or if you're organizing research, you could organize workshops or symposia to address specific issues, inviting both academic and agency partners. Um, we've also had students work within the agency sort of as part of their dissertation and do research on specific issues that we need addressed. Um, and also agency involvement in funding reviews, such as RASGAP. I think those are all great ways um, to directly involve agencies in research planning and funding review. And finally, um, when you have research results that you think will be useful to an agency, direct communication is often one of the best approaches. So you could reach out to, for example, set up a brown bag or direct presentation to agency staff. Um, you could organize or present at a free symposium or offer a field trip or site visit. Or if you're trying to cast a broader net, sharing through media outlets that have a management audience may be an effective option as well. Um, and I think all of these approaches make it more likely for staff with limited time and resources to get exposure to research findings. And with that, um, thank you to some of my colleagues at the Coastal Commission who gave uh, their perspective in helping me craft this talk. And thank you to USCC Grant for the invitation and for hosting. And finally, thank you to the research community for all that you do to produce great and usable science that really does uh, make it possible for agencies like the Commission to do the work that we do in an effective way. And my contact information is at the bottom. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you to our panel here. I think this has just been so rich of information that I wish I had as a grad student back in the day, just really being thoughtful and intentional um, in how to best plug in with management needs directly. So thank you so much. I'm really excited to be able to highlight this work and the conference proceedings that we're hoping to develop from today. Um, I just want to welcome people again to um, put any questions in the Q&A or the chat or raise your hand as we go along. Um, but I have one to get us started. Um, so we, you know, we've heard a lot of reflections today about best practices, research to action. I'm just curious of your reflections on what you've heard today, whether that be the researchers, whether that be others on this panel, kind of things that really resonate or things that, you know, maybe haven't been as prevalent for your organization, kind of things to bring home and apply. I'll just open that up to whoever would like to speak on that. I could take a stab at it. Go for um, it. I think, you know, as I was noticing how much other people's comments were similar to mine, just the thing that really stood out was relationship building. And I think that was so cool to see from the research side and from um, our perspective as managers, how much making those connections and building those relationships ends up being critical to um, making the research actually applicable and getting the research into the hands of the end user. So um, I think it's difficult because we all are kind of strapped for time and funding and whatnot, but it just puts a point on the value of that, even though it is difficult given our constraints. Thanks for that, Megan. I had a question for you just as follow-up and then interested to hear others. So, I mean, we think about this a lot at Seagrant as well, right? Engagement early and often. Um, 
that's a lot of work for researchers to do, right? So you bring in these bridge building organizations, groups like Sea Grant and others, but I've also seen kind of a change in funding models as well to try and directly support some of that relationship building time, right? Um, to factor that in to provide support for students and others, um, because it is a lot to develop proposals to kind of get to know the local needs. So I'm just curious if you've seen that as a model in other places, are there alternative ways to try and kind of encourage that relationship building, um, that engagement to really truly understand what, what needs exist? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is difficult. Um, I think when there are, there is more capacity on the research end, like in the type of grant program you just mentioned, I think that could be really helpful because agency staff, um, there isn't a ton of leeway, right? It's like, we have our core mission a lot of times of project review is like first and foremost, and to the extent we can engage in, in discussions about science that will be beneficial to that, that's amazing, but a lot of times there just simply aren't enough people or isn't enough, um, there aren't enough hours in a week. <laughs> and we also have very strict sort of like limitations on how many hours you can actually spend on doing certain things. And so, um, yeah, I think the more you can give capacity to research staff to like meet the agencies where they are, that's really helpful. Um, and also there luckily are a lot of times when uh, agencies, even the Coastal Commission, have funding to solicit direct research on a specific question. And I think that's a, another sort of funding model that's really helpful, where like we have some very specific management need and can put out a, an RFP for uh, someone to address that directly. Uh, if I can croak through it, um, you know, part of Part of uh, the science collaborative, <clears throat> I didn't get into the, the types of projects that we fund, um, but one of them we call Catalyst, um, where it's strictly for uh, developing that capacity, helping uh, helping bring the the a future team of researchers and agency and community um, together for a year, um, usually to really dig in understand the gaps, understand what questions need to be answered. Um, we have some great examples of that uh, here in Bay Area at, uh, at China Camp, understanding how the road here at the NUR, the San Francisco Bay NUR, um, went through a catalyst grant. Um, and then that led to a proposal for a full funding um, of research, which lasts, which is now going on. And that involved a lot of engagement with the tribe uh, the, the the local tribes it involves a lot of um, hydrology work. So that doesn't mean that that next project is singular. It might be the catalyst type project opened up the doors and then this more comprehensive research program or project can be funded potentially successfully because it's already got that capacity developed. So that's a potential model. Um, I mean, personally, I would love to see California have a science collaborative type project or a program. Um, I may or may not be looking at you, Caitlin. I don't know. Uh, but I think it just has helped a lot of stimulation um, for researchers to meet managers, managers to meet researchers and give that extra, extra bandwidth for both to learn each other's language and then to do that community engagement that like Patrick was talking about. Um, and, and engaging. So those little tweaks, a little bit of funding can really blow open a really much more successful and comprehensive project. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Megan. That's really helpful. Um, thank you, Ian Walker, for the question um, in the chat. So this has come up from a few of our speakers about the importance of longitudinal data, not just kind of a quick injection of funds, but sustained funding. Um, and Ian's question, is about perspectives on how res your respective agencies or experiences otherwise view use and support of monitoring data sets and programs, um, given that the data can really be hard to come by these long-term longitudinal data sets. 
I'm happy to pop in on that one. Just for OPC's perspective, that's a challenge for us in that we often, um, you know, whether it be proposition funding or general funds, we have certain, you know, moments in time of funding that allows um, to be a catalyst or an incubator for, for new projects or innovation or innovative research, but that long-term monitoring piece is really, really challenging. Our closest example would be for long, we have uh, supported long-term monitoring for the MPA network, the Marine Protected Areas Network throughout California. And partially that's because the legislature does have an annual general fund appropriation specific to the MPA program. It's relatively modest and so we do have to supplement it, but that is our longest data set that OPC is had the ability to invest in a long-term sustained manner. Otherwise, we are looking at partnering with other agencies. It's partnering with federal agencies uh, such as NOAA, not necessarily within San Francisco Bay near Doug, but, but certainly with others as identifying where those potential sustained sources um, right now. So it's it unfortunately is kind of that more cobbled approach based on what funding is available to the agency and what's the timeline of that funding. Um, Right now, we are undertaking a pretty robust science-informed task force through the Ocean Science Trust to inform a 2025 report card. Uh, it's part of our strategic plan. This was adopted now about four years ago, but it's a 2025 deadline of an ocean health report card that um, also dovetails to West the climate change indicator work that you had referenced with OEHA as far as what indicators can we assess now, but what are those gaps because of those um, monitoring lack of long-term sustained monitoring data sets on certain um, indicators, whether it be chemical or biological, et cetera. And so that's something that we're actively looking to, so we can inform longer term agency, specifically OPC investments, and in a way make that uh, justification for that longer term sustained monitoring model. It's, it is a challenge. Yeah, and I can piggyback off uh, some of those Caitlin's remarks. We we rely on long-term monitoring very much so for our fish advisories. Uh, the state water board through the SWAM program has had decades long monitoring of bass for mercury levels and just looking at trends. And as part of that, um, they'll collect additional fish species so we can try and focus on tribally relevant species as well as uh, species important to subsistence groups. And that's some of our main focuses. And the the Stu Work Group right now is undergoing a, sort of a long term monitoring feedback from various stakeholders and interested parties, and which will actually be dis discussed uh, this Wednesday also in the afternoon. So there's, yeah, that's super important for us. But it's logistically and resource intensive and difficult to secure that sort of funding. Yeah, I can, I can add on to that a little bit. I don't know how much time we have left. Um, you can cut me off, Amalia. Um, but yeah, Ian, um, you're spot on. Um, you know, even, even on the federal side with this program where we have resources and established monitoring stations at all the NERS on a national level with standard methodologies, um, you know, we have to have a, uh, within our priorities in our, um, in our program, we have a change analysis priority, like asking for people to come and do research on these long-term data sets that go back. Um, you know, South Slough, Oregon, um, NUR is 50 years old. So there's data that it goes back a very long time in some of these places. And yet it's not just an open spigot, um, unfortunately. And so we encourage that in our program, we encourage that in um, integrated ecological assessment work. And so it's, it's sort of dependent on that competitive nature of getting the funding because the infrastructure is there within the reserve system. And then you attach it to the oozes, the, uh, the IOS systems. Um, you, we, there are data to mine. Um, it may not always be at the resolution that we want for coastal change or biological shifts, but it does provide a background noise kind of uh, understanding. So um, so yeah, we, we try and encourage it, but it's, it is a small piece of the, all the priorities that we're trying to fund. It's a challenge. I don't have a good answer other than agreeing with you. It's a challenge. 
Well, I'm sorry to have to wrap us up because I think this could be a whole half day workshop itself. So maybe down the line it will be. Um, but again, this is kind of the first of a series of conversations we hope to have. We're really thankful to all those on this panel for being such great partners with USCC grant funded research. Um, and I'm gonna close this out to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, thank you to our panelists, all of you today. I wanna turn it over to my colleague, Karina. Um, just for a final um, closeout. Great, thank you, Amalia. And thank you again to all of our speakers, um, our audience members for all of your thoughtful contributions and how we can continue to advance this research to application process to inform management of, of the urban ocean and in these places where we have really complex and sometimes some of these wicked problems. Um, so going forward, we ask if you have three minutes to take our quick survey. We have a QR code here, and we've also linked the, the link in the chat. Um, just a few minutes that will inform future programming by USCC grant and will allow you an opportunity to share your thoughts on, on um, things learned or things you would like to see going forward. Um, we have the recording and we also will be developing conference proceedings from all of the content today um, in the next few months and we'll be sure to share that as soon as that's prepared but we invite you again to reach out with any additional thoughts that you'd like to share as we develop those and lastly we want to thank the national sea grant office for their support of this workshop uh, and the opportunity to be able to talk about these things with um, both the researchers and the decision makers. Uh, so again, I'll say a big, big thank you to everybody for taking time your Monday afternoon on your rainy Monday afternoon uh, to, to sit with us and learn from each other. Thank you, everyone. Take care, be well in all this crazy weather. It is pouring in LA. Yeah, and stay healthy.